room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, um, good morning everybody and welcome to the 54th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses will be briefing us via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live when it's open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their devices when they aren't speaking. So I just wanted to let members know this is quite a heavy um, agenda we have this morning to get through before 12 o'clock because this is our, our short meeting um, and we have three briefings so if um, members can can try and, and um, be brief in contributions and we'll get round everybody as best as possible. Um, just also to advise members that um, Michael Greer from our committee staff, his mother passed away on Monday night, so I'm sure the, the committee members would um, seek to extend our condolences to, to Michael and his family. Um, so just moving on then to item number one, which is apologies. We have apologies from Gordon this morning. Um, we are waiting on a few other members to join us, but um, we aren't expecting any other apologies. Um, so moving on then to item number two, which is chair's business. Um, at page three of your table papers, there is correspondence from the Assembly Business Engagement Manager regarding the dissolution of the Assembly Business Trust in order to move business engagement in-house. Uh, a research project and online survey is being conducted to develop and shape the new in-house arrangements, and Assembly members and staff have been invited to participate in the survey. Um, it's also proposed to roll out this survey to committee stakeholders who will have um, an interest. So if members are agreed that we will forward it on to the committee stakeholders to seek their views. Thank you. All right, thank you. Moving on then to item number three, which is draft minutes. Um, they are at page six of your pack from the meeting on the 3rd of March. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank, thank you. you. Moving on then to item number four, which is our briefing from um, Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance uh, on COVID-19 and tourism recovery. There is a clerk's memo at page 16 of your pack. There is a statement from NIDA on, on the budget at page 20. There is a briefing update and tourism recovery plan from the Tourism Recovery Steering Group at page 24 of your pack. An updated clerk's memo at page six of table papers to note that the um, national or the NI director of the National Trust is joining the oral briefing today, and a briefing paper from NIDA at page ten of your table papers, and a policy brief from the National Trust on sustainable tourism at page sixteen of table papers. So, can I ask to bring into the spotlight, please, Dr. Joanne Stewart, who is the CEO of NIDA, and Heather McLaughlin, who is the NI director of the National Trust. And if I hand over to yourselves, Joanne and Heather, to, to make an opening statement, and then we can open it up to members for questions. Um, hello, Chair, and um, thank you again for the opportunity to brief the committee today um, with regards to tourism. Um, I think when I think back to some of the briefings that we've done, um, we are in a, a much different situation in that there is real hope for the future um, with the success of the rollout of the vaccination programme in Northern Ireland and across the UK, um, and seeing that our um, figures with regard to the health health impact um, of COVID-19, um, although you know are, are still very difficult to read, um, are going in the in the right direction. So what I wanted to do today was really give you an update on the current situation and really the next six to twelve months of how we see um, things rolling out for tourism and the support that is going to be required from government. But also we're now at a point where we need to look beyond COVID and um, I'm. I'm delighted that our member, Norton, um, the National Trust, um, and their Northern Ireland director, Heather McLaughlin, is able to um, join and brief the, the committee today all around sustainability and um, the regenerative um, strategy that we need to be looking at for tourism moving forward. 
As you said, Chair, um, I've provided um, a short update um, on the report that we produced, um, I think it was at the end of last summer, um, the scale of the crisis facing tourism. Um, obviously, since that report, um, things have um, changed. Um, I think we, we were not expecting um, the um, length of the, the pandemic and the impact of that um, to have been as, um, as bad, really, as it has been since then. Um, so we, we've sort of come through a really difficult time, obviously, since Christmas, but are now in a position where we're starting to look at when we may reopen, um, obviously, following the publication of the uh, plan to ease the restrictions um, published by the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, we've also seen the publication of the Economic Recovery Action Plan. And again, we see that was something that I was able to join the Minister um, on um, as tourism has been recognised as a, as a key economic driver um, and a number of actions to support the recovery and rebuilding of tourism is included in that plan. Obviously, what we now want to see is um, a, approval of that plan and allocation of the £290 million pounds that will be required um, to actually deliver on that plan being agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive. In addition, obviously, we had the announcement of the budget from the Chancellor and again a number of areas that we have continually raised, um, um, some of which have been addressed, for example the extension of the furlough scheme, um, the extension of the VAT rate for tourism and hospitality at 5%, um, although we were very disappointed that there has been um, no further progress on addressing the competitive disadvantage that Northern Ireland faces due to um, the uh, double charging of um, air, air air passenger duty um, but these are things that we will continue to take up um, with the with the UK government. So just um, going to the report, which I hope that you have um, in front of you, um, obviously since the last report, um, we have updated um, the impact of COVID-19 um, on, the, on the tourism industry. Um, we have lost the first quarter um, of 2021. Um, we know that we are ultimately going to lose Easter, which um, can account for um, almost 15% of, of annual income um, to tourism. So we are estimating that, um, you know, we're probably sitting at around 800 million um, of lost business um, to tourism from the start um, of the of the pandemic. But also within the report, we thought again it was just really important um, to um, lay out the importance of tourism to the Northern Ireland economy. Now, obviously, I appreciate with the um, with the committee, you've been very supportive um, of tourism, and I have had the opportunity to, to brief you on a, on a number of occasions. But I think it's worth just looking back as well to see um, how tourism you know, has, has grown um, prior to uh, COVID-19. And we were definitely on an upward uh, trajectory with regards to achieving the ambition of the industry to double the size of tourism by 2030. And this is still an ambition, but we obviously need to look differently now at how um, we will achieve that. But a couple of things I think are really important is the tourism generates the demand um, for um, the, the different activities and experiences um, that um, uh, visitors consume and therefore are serviced by other sectors um, within the economy. Um, and we've seen growth in that visitor spend um, of 46% um, since 2014. So although we estimate that it's going to take three to four years before we get back to those levels, um, we are fortunate in Northern Ireland that we have the infrastructure, we have the culture and the heritage, um, and we have everything that people are looking for uh, to come to Northern Ireland. So um, if we can, once we can get through um, the, um, the challenging um, sort of six to 12 months, um, then I think we will start to, to see tourism on a footing um, that will um, grow. So we just include a diagram with regards to, you know, how tourism, um, you know, supports the rest of the economy. And I think it's also important um, just to, um, to remind people that this is an industry that delivers across Northern Ireland. Um, if we don't have 
if we're not able to attract visitors to Northern Ireland, um, although sectors um, will do okay with the domestic market, it is only the additional visitors that we bring into Northern Ireland that will actually generate growth and therefore tourism is that engine for growth for sectors such as um, hospitality, for accommodation um, and you know our entertainment and, and theatres etc. Um, so that's um, the importance of, of tourism and I think one of the things that we're asking for the Northern Ireland Executive is to ensure that that infrastructure um, is invested in. If we don't have um, the attractions, the connectivity um, that makes it easy and uh, gives people reasons to come to Northern Ireland, then that's what makes it really difficult to create that growth opportunity for the, for the rest of the um, economy. I just want to finish off with a, a couple of points with regards to what is really needed um, in, the, in the short term. Um, and the first thing is around generating demand. Um, we are probably going to be open um, in time for summer this year. Um, we're in a fortunate position that um, Northern Ireland is part of that UK vaccination programme, um, which is way ahead of, of where we expected it to be. So the GB market is a huge opportunity for us this summer. So what we want to see is the demand stimulation. We want to see Tourism Ireland, um, you know, really um, maximising that opportunity and starting to get those marketing campaigns out. Um, we also need to ensure that people are able to get here. So as part of that easing of restrictions, we want to see um, the restrictions on travel from GB to Northern Ireland um, eased as obviously as as the as soon as the time is right with regards to the Republic, this was an, a really important market for us last year. And um, we saw an increase of 200% on the visitors from um, the Republic of Ireland. Um, obviously, it's disappointing the news this week um, that they are struggling to get um, the levels of uh, the vaccination um, that we require. Um, and really, we would like to see um, you know, how we can all work together to ensure that across the island of Ireland, um, that we are in a very strong position with regards to the rollout of the vaccination so that we can really maximise our home markets um, for, for this year. But I think um, obviously I, everything else is in the document and I and obviously will be happy to answer any questions. Um, but it is important where I'm focusing on that short to midterm that we really start to, to lift our heads um, and look to the future. Um, and I'm delighted that Heather McLaughlin from National Trust um, will be able to give you an update on, on the work that they're doing and what we need to think about with regards to sustainable tourism moving forward. You there, Heather? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Joanne, for that introduction, and thank you uh, to the committee for uh, giving some time today to discuss this really important um, issue. Um, I'm not sure if you'll all be aware of who National Trust are or what we do, and as a conservation char charity and a tourism partner, it's probably worth just giving you a little brief background. We are a conservation charity and we care for um, many places across Northern Ireland, special places such as uh, Northern Ireland's only World Heritage Site, Durant's Causeway, the Highest Mountain, Sleeve Donard, internationally important, beautiful Strangford Lock, and many houses and gardens, including Mount Stewart in County Down, the Argery in Mid Ulster, and Florence Court in County Fermanagh. Our purpose in caring for these and many other spaces is to ensure that they are accessible and enjoyed by local communities and visitors from all over the world uh, for now and forever. And in um, pre COVID times, we were probably welcoming up to um, over 5 million people to our places across Northern Ireland. So we were the single um, highest provider of tourism visits for Northern Ireland and therefore see that we have a really important role uh, both now and in the longer term in terms of um, Northern Ireland's economy and particularly the tourism economy. So although um, our core purpose is conservation, um, because of those popular visitor attractions, Giants Causeway and Carrickareed would be two which I would focus in on there. Um, our care and the, uh, of, of those places and the play, part that we play is really, really important looking forward. As Joanne says, um, the impact of COVID on tourism and the hospitality sectors has been um, seismic um, and it has been significant for us too in the Northern, uh, in the National Trust. However, um, we're really now focused on that long-term uh, recovery and um, what we can do in the medium term to get ourselves there. 
but it's key then that we make the right choices uh, and put in the right plans now that give us that sustainable recovery that we need to look at, which balances out economic, social and environmental needs. In other words, a truly sustainable vision for Northern Ireland's um, tourism economy and an associated strategy and plans to achieve that. We are absolutely delighted uh, to see in the Department's economic recovery plan uh, the line uh, and the commitment to a sustainable regenerative tourism strategy uh, and, and thought it might be useful just to um, uh, go a bit wider on why that is. So first of all, we see that a large proportion of Northern Ireland's tourism assets rely on our special landscapes, historic environment and cultural heritage. And therefore, we believe that Northern Ireland's approach to tourism must be sustainable. It needs to be managed in a coordinated way, not just marketed and focused on growth in numbers. Um, and that was very much the direction we were headed in in pre-COVID times. We were already seeing the negative impacts uh, on the host communities where um, our, our larger um, uh, properties were, the environmental impact on these sites, and particularly saw those at Carrickareed, and the negative impact that um, was being seen on visitor experience. So it's clear to us that tourism sustainably managed um, needed to be looked at slightly differently and that we need to make sure that anything that we do for the future benefits the local people and the local economies. Therefore, um, that will provide a means and an incentive for regeneration and investment both within those communities and within the region. And that approach has never been more important than it is now. However, if tourism is not properly managed, it can harm the natural and built environment. And as I say, um, so many of our places are, are, are actually based on that heritage, culture and nature and beauty that Northern Ireland has to offer. So growth of the sector, uh, recovering coronavirus needs to be not at the expense of local communities or the irreplaceable assets on which they rely. It is clear to us and to others across the world that to recover in a sustainable way, Northern Ireland's tourism focus must shift from a volume-based economic model to a high-value model that seeks a balance of economic, social and environmental considerations. Success measures, therefore, should be looking on value that tourism brings, not just on the volume of the numbers that it brings to our shores. Um, and we now have a once in a generational chance to change how we manage our tourism approach and avoid the pitfalls and negative impacts of over tourism that have been seen in other countries, a direction in which we were headed with a focus on increasing numbers of visitors pre-COVID. And one of the things that we had done in the National Trust was to um, set about a, a sustainability study looking at what we might need to do to manage our places at Giants Causeway and Karakuri differently. And that is due to report later on uh, this year. We can already see that the sentiment of travellers is changing and with potential visitors being more green aware and looking for green and quality experiences. It's really important that um, both for visitors and for uh, local people that we are looking at bringing nature back into and closer to our people in our towns and cities, uh, giving a better quality of provision of access to green space with benefits to both local communities and tourists, um, particularly at a time when the focus will be on staycations, domestic tourism. It has got to be part of our approach. So as I say, we wholeheartedly welcome the commitment in the department's econ economic recovery plan to, de to develop a sustainable regenerative tourism strategy, which focuses on economic growth, social wellbeing, and the protection of the environment. But one of the things that does need to be thought about is um, how we can develop that as part of a joined up approach across all government departments. And in particular for tourism, um, there are key roles for the Department of Infrastructure, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, communities and finance. Like every aspect of green recovery and green growth, uh, success will depend on connected strategies which complement each other and on the departments working together. This is not a bandwagon to jump on uh, in the various departments. This requires a cohesive, joined up regional approach, looking at how we can grow green, uh, both for tourism and the economy, and our communities together. So we'd therefore like to see a greater evidence of and greater commitment to a coherent joined up approach across government, as well as commitment to ensuring that all parts of the tourism industry and local communities are engaged in the de development of such approach. 
A sustainable tourism approach will also need targeted investment and policies to support it. Uh, and we believe that those need to be in, focused in areas of infrastructure, which are looking at roads, sustainable transport hubs and the like, uh, targeted product development. And Joanne talked about the need that we do need to invest in um, looking at, at further product development for tourists when they come back to our shores. Um, developing uh, dispersal opportunities across uh, Northern Ireland and probably the island of Ireland to ensure that tourism benefits are beyond Belfast and the North Coast. We need to look at event pro programming and also the delivery of more cost-effective targeted marketing. I suppose a good example of how we can start to realise this and a really good opportunity to put sustainable tourism approach into practice will be through some of the tourism projects coming through the city deals, which I know you'll all be aware of, which along with the economic boost across many parts of Northern Ireland will provide real opportunities for local communities. Um, and it's absolutely essential to ensure that all the projects coming forward truly are sustainable, not only economically, but in terms of their social and environmental impact. So drawing to a close, it would be remiss of me not to mention the biggest challenge um, follows of chasing tourism recovery, and that's climate change. And this lies at the heart of a sustainable regenerative tourism strategy. So in order to build resilience in the tourism sector for the future, we need to better understand the likely impacts of climate change on the sector and begin to put in place appropriate mitigations and adaptations. All those involved in tourism need to work together to understand how we can achieve a successful sustainable tourism offer while also playing our part in moving towards a net carbon future for Northern Ireland. No one individual or organisation will have the answers to these challenges, but we will all have to work together towards this goal, making where possible the best possible use of our historic buildings, which can retain embodied carbon and reduce emissions support regeneration of towns, cities and high streets, generate tourism and local economic activity, offering spaces for shared cultural experience. While a, a sustainable regenerative tourism strategy is very welcome for Northern Ireland, it is also important that there's cooperation across the island of Ireland and across all countries of the UK. For it to, to be truly sustainable, we need to see a collaborative work um, across those long-term tourism strategies across all those countries with sustainability at their core, embedding quality, val um, value and wider public benefit as a measure of success rather than volume alone. These should set out a path to re-establishing re domestic and international tourism markets in the context of the coronavirus pandemic and the climate crisis. So inclusion, and in conclusion, we very much look forward to continuing working with this committee, with NITA, Tourism NI and all other government departments in playing our part in a sustainable recovery for Northern Ireland and be happy to take any questions along with Joanne. Many thanks. Okay, thank you both for, for those um, briefings. They're really informative and give us a, a good update. Um, I have a couple of questions and I'll maybe just put the, the questions to you um, and try to lead by example here this morning and not ask a whole load. Um, but I suppose, first of all, I wonder, is there learning from last summer that is potentially useful in terms of looking forward to reopening again this summer um i know the you know that the likes of the good to go scheme last year how successful was that um in terms of, of instilling consumer confidence and and encouraging people back out and about and um secondly i suppose the impact of the um the numbers of visitors from from the south in particular has that been captured in terms of, of planning for the um the reopening this this season again in terms of having a really joined up approach across the island to to tourism and tourism promotion and then uh one for for heather as well um i, I really i think it's really important that we do have that look at the kind of sustainable tourism piece and it's really important um I, i'm from a, a part of the the north that has a really strong tourism sector and I think it is really important that we are um, planning uh, our tourism offering um, with communities and in terms of doing that uh, I look forward to seeing some of the, uh, the, the results of the studies that you have mentioned but also in taking advantage of that active tourism I suppose we've seen an awful lot more people out and about doing you know walking and whatever else because there's not very much to do at the minute but there is an impact that that has 
on um, on particular areas where everybody goes to walk. So, you know, what can we be doing to be um, informing the public as well? And do you think there is enough being done in that space to, um, you know, to alleviate some of the impacts that we are seeing on on our, our local beauty spots? So, if I maybe put those three to you. Um, thank you, Chair, um, and I'll, I'll pick up the, the first two. Um, with regards to the um, learnings from last year, um, absolutely, we have a lot more information now um, on um, you know how what is the best way to, to reopen. Um, and I think we've seen that um, with the publication of the plan um, from the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, although there weren't specific dates in it, it was clearly set out um, at the review points um, and the information that was going to be reviewed. But what we do need is more transparency on the conditions that need to be met to enable businesses um, to reopen. Um, and businesses require an appropriate notice period um, as to when those restrictions um, are going to be lifted so that they are ready um, to reopen. Um, we cannot be in a situation where businesses 24 hours before they're due to reopen still aren't sure whether they can open or not. Um, and also uh, businesses just can't, uh, they just don't have the ability to burden the costs um, of having to open and reclose. So really for business at the moment, we want to be able to open, um, but open um, for the long term. Um, so if we need to uh, wait a little bit more time until the conditions are right, um, but we need to see transparency on that. Um, with regards to um, the restrictions, I think there needs to be a recognition and alignment of how the restrictions um, can impact on the financial value viability of businesses reopening. So for example, from a tourism perspective, if we are going to open, we want to be able to market to people, to attract them to different experiences, attractions, and if there are travel restrictions in place, um, we're unable to do that. And therefore, um, you're, you're not able to um, generate the business um, that you need uh, to be in a financial viable position. So the consequences of different restrictions and their impact um, needs to be um, better understood. Also more engagement with industry. Um, there has been a lot of work to do on the good to go. That has been extended, um, obviously, into 2021. Um, it was successful last year in giving um, consumers that confidence um, of, the, of the investment that had been uh, put in place by tourism businesses to ensure the environment was as safe for them and staff um, when they visited. One of the issues coming out of that, however, is around the uh, social distancing restrictions. Um, and uh, and we see if we look at um, our attractions, um, including um, the National uh, Trust um, properties, you know, you're in a situation where you were down 70% on the number of people um, that you're able to safely host um, given the, the social distancing um, and that's a consideration with regards to financial support that will be required once businesses reopen um, and then start to generate um, the businesses that will enable them to, um, to move forward. Um, I think on the other one with regards to the Republic of Ireland, um, Tourism Northern Ireland have set up a task force that is chaired by Judith Owens from Titanic Belfast um, with regards to the Republic of Ireland marketing or market. Um, as we said, um, last year saw a 200% increase on the number of visitors and the reviews from those visitors, um, you know, again, we exceeded their expectations um, of the experience um, that they had. So um, it's very much about understanding who wants to come so very much a family market for example um, and the sort of experiences that they want when they come up so i think we're definitely getting ourselves in a situation where we can maximize the opportunity as i say the only um challenge with that is regards to the rollout of the vaccination program and any travel restrictions that may take longer to lift and um, because of that situation i'll hand over then to heather to answer that third question yeah, so thank you, Joanne. Um, and, and yes, we've we've seen obviously a real a big increase in the number of people who have come to our outdoor sites. Um, and in Northern Ireland, we're absolutely truly blessed in that we we, we have so many of them. Um, but at the same time, we do have the restrictions of uh, not having a, a, a right to roam here in Northern Ireland. So those places for service as well would be included in this, have seen that upsurge of people. And I think one of the things we've seen is that um, people's behaviours, uh, there are a lot of people who've come into the countryside who, who haven't um, been there before. And while that's really good for people's health and well-being, there's behavioural issues in terms of litter, taking that home, um, 
and leave no trace. So if there was something that could be done in helping people understand um, what they can do to help look after the place um, that they're visiting, it would be that, along with using the paths, networks and trails which are in place rather than um, not using them because uh, we've obviously seen uh, a, again an increase in erosion around a number of the sites that we're, we're managing. Um, big problem has been around traffic, if I'm very honest, um, with uh, social distancing in place and only being able to, to travel in uh, single cars. Um, parking and managing cars has been one of the biggest challenges and will continue to be a challenge um, and unfortunately police are having to come in and close roads which was never something we would ever have imagined that you would be closing roads to access um, a, a, a site of beauty um, and an outdoor site. So <clears throat> there is something about our infrastructure and parking and moving people around. And actually that was already being indicated up in the North Coast with the number of visitors we were having pre-COVID that we were coming to a point where we need to look at how do we make sure we've got the right infrastructure, transport infrastructure, that means that people are, their visitor experience is not about um, sitting in their car on a road in a traffic jam. And I believe there's, there's some work that we need to do there. So when I talk about sustainability and getting other departments involved, that's absolutely one of the key things I think that we need to look at for the future. Thank you for that. Um, thanks for, for both of those answers. I think there's things that we, we can take out and follow up on both of those. And um, I think but in particular, Harold, there, there where you mentioned, you know, the need maybe for information um, and maybe an information campaign around behaviour in, in um, terms of people accessing outdoor sites and things like that. So that's something we can take on board. Um, can I bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Yes, uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, uh, Joanne and Heather, and thank you very much for the information you've given to us. Um, I'm not going to concentrate on the questions that I'm sure others will ask just about the immediate start-up of the um, tourism business and industry in Northern Ireland, but you did say that, it, that you're looking at a three- to four-year period over which you think we will be able to return to where we left off pre-COVID. What I want to know and want to want to look at with you, and particularly Heather, is the lessons that have been learned. And she's just made a reference to one, for example, all those cars piling up at beauty spots over the winter um, because people could only travel in a single car. I, I'm particularly concerned to, to address the issue of how we enhance um, the green tourism take in Northern Ireland, how we advance the sustainability of tourism in Northern Ireland, uh, and how we get away from those queues of cars coming to National Trust properties or other places around Northern Ireland, and how we can deliver uh, tourists and visitors better to those places, and how we can also engage with them from a sustainable and environmental perspective, because our planet is under threat. and. We need to take that lesson incredibly seriously. And while I appreciate that you have incredible pressures at this point in the time, um, moving forward, we need to be presenting Northern Ireland as a very attractive place to come to because we're addressing those environmental and green issues, sustainability issues, and reducing our carbon footprint at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to take that, Joanne, if, if that's all right. Um, I th think it's one of the, the, the lessons learned and one of the things that we did do in response to COVID uh, and to manage capacity and to give people confidence was the introduction of a booking system. Uh, and again, that was something that we hadn't ever uh, thought about, um, but that has enabled us to make sure that we are uh, keeping our visitors safe and our staff and volunteers safe at the same time <clears throat> and making sure that people have the best visitor experience and then can get parked up, get to the place that they need and then have introduced um, one-way systems uh, and visitor experience based on self-led programming, so that giving people the tools to enjoy our sites in a slightly different way. It's definitely a long-term um, challenge for us in terms of what that might look like for the, for the future. And going back to what we were saying earlier on, there's something about us redefining how we want people to, to visit Northern Ireland, that we are looking at them coming for a period of time, spending time here, and it's a high-value visit, rather than having um, lots and lots of people coming for maybe one or two days, which is one of the, the things that we had seen, um, and particularly seeing people arriving in Dublin 
maybe coming up to Giants Causeway, Titanic, and then going back down to Dublin again, which was not really um, helping uh, the Northern Ireland tourism economy. Transportation has got to be one of the key things, Stuart, I think, in terms of um, looking forward. That network, our ability to move people around um, uh, our places and looking at dispersal strategy, which is I would imagine will be part of what that sustainable regenerative tourism strategy will need to take into, yeah. play, into account. That we look at where the capacity is, where our products are, and then we make it easy for people to move between places and, if possible, using tr public transport would be obviously the nirvana if we could get to that point i don't know that we ever will but there's something about that holistic approach which is then back to we need to have a coherent interdepartmental view of this of how we can work together to make it much more um uh, net carbon you know uh, and carbon um, neutralize as much as possible so that we can actually um, have that green credential which we've got that we've got that green credential um in terms of the assets that we provide i think it's just then how we provide it in terms of the supporting services is going to be the challenge and that is an interdepartmental challenge if i could just add to that um, also it's about how we connect the different experiences so there's a lot of work has been being done on clusters um, around northern ireland where tourism businesses whether it's in the north coast whether it's in strangford um, come together to put together you know how the, how all of the experiences link in so if somebody is going and just thinks about going to the giants causeway it's how do we actually broaden that so it's much more than the giants causeway and you can spend more time um, in the north coast and um, and experience more. Um, as, um, as, as Heather said, um, we need to be able to articulate the reasons that rather than Northern Ireland being a day trip from Dublin, um, that Northern Ireland is a longer visit because we're able to very clearly articulate um, you know, how people can do different things in Northern Ireland and that it's worth spending more time. Um, so it's again, it's how we join up um, all of those clusters as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just very, very briefly, because I know Joanne made reference to air passenger duty in, in her opening remarks. I see today the Prime Minister saying that it is something which he is prepared to review. But would she agree with me that um, that because Northern Ireland's connectivity is so different from the rest of the UK, that 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 despite the fact that it is counterintuitive in terms of the environment and, and the green agenda, that nevertheless Northern Ireland needs to have that issue addressed for it. But I think it was also pleasing to note that the Prime Minister did say today as well that um, the future fuel for jet aircraft needs to be reviewed as well. And we all may wish to note that this week Japan announced the, lar the world's largest eco-jet fuel manufacturing plant. Yeah, no, absolutely, um, Stuart. And again, obviously, welcomed the uh, publication of the Union Connectivity um, Review Interim Report, but which does obviously draw attention to air passenger duty, although we have all been fighting this for years um, and, um, and we haven't seen any movement on it. I think what we need to remember is that air passenger duty does not. Um, address the, uh, the challenges of, of climate change. Obviously, what it does is it tries to, you know, it's more about putting people off maybe um, uh, flying. But in Northern Ireland, obviously, we are disadvantaged by being charged twice. But I think you need to look at the airlines, the amount of investment that's been made with regards to them tackling um, climate change and, the, um, and how they get to um, zero carbon um, emissions. And really look at other tax we're looking at a tax that actually tackles it and doesn't um, disadvantage the individual um, for for flying, particularly um, from Northern Ireland. But yes, well, you know whether it's going to be um, abolishment of APD. I think the other important thing is that for Northern Ireland, this is not something we're asking to be devolved so that we can make a decision here. It is a direct competitive disadvantage and therefore should be abolished for Northern Ireland rather than Northern Ireland have to pay the cost to um, to abolish that itself. Okay, thank you. Um, can I bring in John Stewart, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, folks, thanks so much for the presentation again this morning. Very enlightening, um, very helpful. Um, there's so much in it. Um, as Stuart says, a lot of the focus is, uh, is not only on the current, but you know, looking forward to three or four year years down the line. And we look forward to, to playing our role with yourselves within that. Um, initially, I just want to focus on 
um, the road to immediate recovery. And Joanne, I know you talked about um, leading time. I know I worked previously in hospitality, both in restaurants and bars, and I know you can't just give a sector 24 hours notice, and that goes the same with hotels and with destinations. Um, some areas within the um, time that and recovery could open within 24 hours, but that doesn't apply to anyone I can think of in the tourism sector. So you touched on it, but what sort of timeline would you be looking at? I mean, and, and, and are the executive do you think aware now, given the, the, the errors we made previously? Um, to go alongside that then, um, should there be still a phased amount of government grant support, given that even when restrictions are lifted, some sectors in tourism won't be able to go back to full strength because of limits on numbers, leading times for bookings, etc. Um, I just want to see the sector supported as much as possible. Um, I'm interested to hear your views on that. Um, yes, so then, John, and, that, and that's um, you know very um, important points um, that you've raised. I think what we need to see is more engagement with the industry um, that we didn't have last year, um, with regards to what the conditions need to be um, for us to reopen, and an understanding um, with the executive office with regards to what we are able to do um, and the time that we need to do that. So um, you know it's very hard to say you need three weeks or four weeks or, or two weeks. But if we under if we better understand how the executive are reviewing this um, and also um, taking more of a risk assessment approach to activities. Um, so for example, you know, we've been talking about um, you know lots of the, the places that are open at the moment um, are being, you know, are, are obviously very popular. Um, I know I'm lucky to live near the beach, but I mean I have to do my walk at half six in the morning because it gets so busy um, during the day. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of things within tourism that can can be very um, safe to run in an outdoor and an indoor um, situation. Um that would help to distribute um, you know, uh, people so you're not getting um, the mass numbers um, you know, that we have seen. But there isn't that engagement um, with the executive regarding how you could, um, how you could start to, to phase that reopening. So we definitely are calling for more engagement so there's better understanding, but also understanding um, that if you're going to allow um, businesses to open, um, you have to understand how the regulation and legislation impacts on that. So as I say, you know, at the moment, um, you're not supposed to travel more than 10 kilometres. But if you open up anything in tourism and you're, um, you've still got that restriction, and um, then businesses can't market, they can't encourage people um, to travel more than that distance. Um, it's the same with the uh, restrictions with travel across the common travel area. Um, and again, if you're going to allow businesses to open, you need, especially in tourism, you need to be able to allow us to attract visitors. Um, and that's visitors from outside of Northern Ireland as well within the uh, domestic market. With regards to support, um, I think obviously, as I, as I noted in the report, um, you know the, the tourism businesses have taken on large levels of debt. Um, you know, even with government backed loans, but they're in debt um, to get to this point. Um, we're going to lose Easter, which is another fifteen percent. There are no reserves; they've all been used for businesses just to survive, um, and and it will take time to, to build it up. There obviously will be some businesses that can build very quickly, um, but because we still have those social uh, distancing requirements um, and businesses are only able to trade at about 30% uh, capacity, there will be a need for government to further support um, the industry. Um, in Scotland, they have announced that um, you know um, funding would uh, continue for at least four weeks once businesses reopen. But again, this is this is this is we are just calling that the executive need to engage with industry. Um, we want to get this right, and we want to be able to open um, and and open in a financially viable way. So we'll just call for more engagement and really talk to the industry. Okay, um, thanks. That's that's really helpful. I mean, I'm calling again for the executive to step up and not only provide that clarity and engage with yourselves but with all sectors and also provide at least assurances that the support will be there we still don't even know if support is going to be extended into the new financial year for all sectors affected by lockdown whether it continues never mind the sectors like yourselves who will have a phased return and there are sectors within sectors so some will be chomping at the bit they can open because they know they can attract guests quite quickly and others will not and that's the same in, in other areas you know, I was talking to close contact services today 
people, people, people in the wedding sector, for example, um, and they, they, they're, you know, they do health and beauty, hair and beauty for the wedding sector, and they're, they're, they know when they go back to many won't be weddings straight away, and I'm sure that's the case for some within the tourism sector. So that that assurance of ongoing support while restrictions are in place, but also uh, um, in a phased return, I think needs to be needs to be there. And um, one last thing, because I'm conscious of other people coming behind me, is um, you have done so much, Joanne, across the tourism sector in terms of track and trace and providing um, safe environments within your facilities. I mean, it was an exceptional amount of level as the hospital. Have you had any engagement from the executive for what would expected of the sector should you be required when you reopen this time around and any additional investments you need to make? Um, well, we have um, obviously we've engaged through the um, Tourism Recovery Steering Group, obviously which is chaired by um, Minister Dodds, um, and we've had these um, obviously conversations with regards to um, you know what industry needs, but how industry can support um, the reopening. Obviously, looking at things like guidance and, and the regulations, etc. Um, we haven't that engagement hasn't yet been extended to Department of Health or the Executive Office, where actually the decisions um, or the recommendations um, are being made. Um, so there, there needs to be a more of an openness to that, um, that engagement, um, and that's certainly something we call for. Um, just on the financial support, I just want to obviously um, the, the industry have been very grateful for the support that has been provided, but there are still some problems on the ground, and um, there are still some issues with regards to the LRSS scheme, CRBSS scheme. Um, you know, so there are queries that are still not being resolved, um, and also um, things like the business events sector. Um, um, which has had minimal support. There are still a number of venues out there that haven't seen any support. Um, and you know, business events. We're just this week. We're talking about the strategy um, to 2030. Um, and business events is a really important part of that tourism growth. Um, so there are still some issues with the financial support. Now we are trying to engage, obviously, with uh, Department of Finance and Department for the Economy. Um, so we, we haven't solved all of it yet. But obviously, a, a lot of progress um, has. Has been, has been made, which we are absolutely um, you know, for from the executive. Okay. Thanks for that. If any of those are in my constituency, by the way, I know you're doing great work to, to, to help them, but if any of them need support, please send them my way. I've been working with quite a few hoteliers and then breakfast providers and things, and I'm more than happy to continue to do that. But taken out from what you've said today, I think communication remains the key from the executive yep. to yourselves and the entire sector, and we can't stress that enough. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Um, can I bring in John Dow, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Heather and Joanne, for your presentation thus far. Um, I don't want to go over the, the ground this covers. Let me just touch on a few different things. Uh, one of the concerns has been expressed to me, uh, Joanne, is that a number of major employers in, in your sector have paid off staff rather than furlough them, and that, that's caused great concern. I think it should be a concern to the sector because uh, staff will obviously have to look for other employment, and if you find other employment, and uh, which is better hours in the sense, less unsociable hours because a lot of hours within the tourism sector or the hotel sector, you're working on social hours. So if you go away and you find yourself a job in a different sector, you're not working on social hours, you're not working as many weeks. It's going to be very, very hard to draw you back out of that again and back into the hotel sector. So there may be a skills gap develop when uh, the hotel industry opens up again. Is there concerns that you may have lost a swathe of highly skilled workers, which will be very difficult to replace? Um, absolutely, um, John, and um, and this is something obviously I appreciate that there was the furlough scheme, um, but there are costs associated with the furlough scheme, and you were talking about businesses who literally had gone to zero income. So I know a lot of businesses. Have, I mean, there's obviously over a hundred thousand people um, on furlough. We would estimate that um, almost twenty five percent of that is within tourism and hospitality. Um, so there are a lot of people who have been put on furlough, but some businesses just were not in a financial position to be able to continue. 
with that when elements of their business had just gone. Um, but Roisin McKee, who is the director of the Hospitality and Tourism Skills Network, has been engaging very closely um, with the industry regards to um, you know, the skills. And we know that we need to address um, how we attract people back into the industry um, and how we help to train um, and identify the skills that we need um, as we move forward. As we've been talking about, we need to think a bit differently um, about tourism. And I would recommend that if Roisin hasn't already, that she provides a, a briefing to the committee um, because this is a, an area of major concern and why there's an absolute focus um, through um, HATS um, to engage with the um, industry. We also have the other issue of the new immigration policy um, uh, introduced um, at the UK level. Um, um, obviously, we would have seen um, a lot of seasonal um, recruitment, um, you know, and um, not just within Northern Ireland, but obviously from other European countries, and particularly the Republic of Ireland. Um, and, um, and obviously, with that process having changed, although I don't think it's going to be an issue this year, I think that will start to be more of an issue as the sector recovers and, and starts to grow. Um, but you're absolutely right, there is a, a skills issue and there's a real sector attractiveness issue um, following the impact from COVID. Okay, and then just uh, the final question is in around, you mentioned moving to, well, uh, spreading tourism out uh, across the North. Uh, I've mentioned this to you before around the potential of Loch Ness, which I don't think is fully exploited. Uh, in a sustainable way, I have to add, because I think Heather's made a very good point that we have to have a sustainable tourism industry. And when you look at the the, the ecosystems <coughs> uh, and wildlife in around Loch Ness and the history in around Loch Ness, uh, I, I don't think as a, as a tourism <coughs> destination that has been fully uh, exploited in a sustainable way. Are, are there plans to look at in terms of more ecotourism in that line? Um, yes, and, we, and we've identified that that ecotourism is really important um, for, from a growth perspective because that's what a lot of people um, are looking for. I think the councils have a really important role um, within this, John, um, with regards to product development um, and how the products that are, are there and the experiences link into the, to the overall um, strategy um, for the North, um, you know, uh, the Embrace the Giant spirit. Um, and we've been engaging with, um, with most of the councils um, over the over the last 12 months in supporting their businesses. But I do think uh, councils need to, to step up to really understand um, how they can promote um, those experiences as part of the, the Northern Ireland brand as well. So that that's part of the attraction for people wanting to, to come in. Um, it's also um, with regards to the domestic um, market. I think, again, we're still in a situation where all of us just do not know what we have on our doorstep. Um, and again, I think the councils need to be engaged more with tourism and I on how those special places and experiences can be better promoted. Thanks, John. Okay, thank you. Can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning, Joanne and Heather. Thank you very much for your briefing uh, this morning. And Joanne, can I also express my appreciation to yourself because you brief this committee every single week, uh, send a report in for your industry. And honestly, the stats uh, and the, the, the information that you give is really, really helpful. Um, it's my go-to. I, I have it at hand at all times so that I'm, I'm up to date. So that's really, really good. Um, and in relation to the structure, I suppose, of the Tourism Recovery Steering Group and the Working Group, I think it has proven itself to be very, very helpful to the department. Uh, and it's something that should be uh, the mainstay uh, going forward. And um, I really appreciate the outputs uh, and the documentation and the recovery plan that we see, because I think it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, and but it's like everything else in, in life we can have a great plan but if we don't have the money um, placed beside it then it becomes useless it becomes an aspiration an unattainable aspiration do you believe that there is enough money in place or uh, put against some of these objectives that we've got in this plan uh, in order to deliver uh, a, set, a successful recovery 
Um, so I think there's a good understanding of what the costs are, um, and especially when you look at the Economic um, Recovery Action Plan, which has been published with costs. Um, so we know what it's going to cost, but um, that then needs to be allocated you know, by the Northern Ireland Executive. So there has certainly not been, um, we don't have the money there at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So we have the plan, but no money. And we know that um, it's going to be very flat from a budget perspective um, next year, or you know, this in the next financial year. So um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done at the executive level. And that's why, again, setting out in the importance of tourism to drive demand within the economy and, and the growth engine um, is really important so that when those discussions are being um, decided, um, that we do get the level of um, investment that's needed. I think the challenge, the additional challenge you've got this year is that businesses don't have the um, ability to do a lot of this investment themselves due to the debt and the depletion of reserves. So they're going to need some time to, to trade. Um, and so we need things like, so the Experience Development Programme, uh, which has been run by Tourism NI, is a good example of where we can help businesses to invest to enable them to grow their business. But again, they can get bogged down in bureaucracy um, with regards to the likes of CPD, um, etc. So there are sometimes there are really good um, initiatives, but the actual delivery mm -hmm. is a lot, a lot more difficult on the ground. In, in your plan or in your presentation, um, you indicated that you were going to look at prioritisation um, of, of some of the programmes. Have, have any priority areas been identified? If um, the money that you require is not all there, what, what is essential in order for, for, for recovery to take place? In the first instance, in, 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 in you know, hopefully May, June, July, you know, and, and basically are, are you of the belief that we are uh, selling to our domestic market and what do you indicate that that domestic market is, you know, is it the islands um, or, or, or where do you see the prioritization there? Um, well, I would I would refer to it as our home markets, um, and that is obviously domestic, as in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and GB. That those are our our markets um, for for this year. So the biggest priority for me is we have got to stimulate that demand. We we already know that people are starting to think about booking holidays, um, and we need to get that message out there. So I think the campaigns are ready to go, Sinead, but they the sort of the button hasn't been pressed yet, um, and. And I think we, we can't wait to the last minute because people will have made their decisions. So this is really important from a Tourism Ireland perspective. The GB is going to be back sooner, I think, than the Republic. Um, but it's a different situation for the Republic. So Tourism Ireland really have to focus on Northern Ireland specific campaign because that's where the opportunity is. Um, and also things like the rollout of the holiday at home voucher scheme by Tourism NI those things are really important to ensure that our, our own you know, people who live in Northern Ireland um, you know, see the uh, benefits and advantage of having a holiday at home um, this year um, and then we see once it's safe for the Republic of Ireland um, so for me it's about that demand stimulation then um, it's about connectivity and I think as Heather had said not just connectivity to get to Northern Ireland but to move around Northern Ireland um, and, um, and how we bring back our coach operators um, and, um, and investing in public transport um, so that people are able to maximise the experience that they have. Okay, thank you. And the other thing that I would um, really like to bring up as well is that you know it, it's really important that um, these conversations have been had with um, the, our local councils uh, they are, a, you know, they are a priority stakeholder in all of this, uh, and it's really important that they are in the middle of all of these conversations. Joanne, can I ask? Um, I've had a lot of um, inquiry um, in relation to tourism agents, and, and, and we've been looking at ways that we can give grant support to them, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, have you been working with this side of your industry? Um, yes, and that's why we've sort of we talk now about more than tourism and travel rather than tourism and hospitality, because um, the travel industry, both um, inbound and outbound, will support tourism. So travel agents are an important part of that. We've been working with APTA uh, with regards to calling for that support, and I know there is a grouping, obviously, of the travel agents in Northern Ireland 
who have been engaging um, with the minister. However, there is nothing has uh, come um, out of those discussions. There was an understanding. Um, but we haven't seen any support and we continue to call for that. And in fact, as you see, it's in, it's in my document, as well as support for the business events sector, um, a lot of the supply chain. And again, going back to the skills, you know, if we lose those skills, um, you know, that we need for the events sector, you know, that will set us back years in, in trying to develop that. Um, but again, there's been no support forthcoming, um, but we continue to engage with both the Department of the Economy and Finance. Um, we think there's an a way to get money out very quickly using existing schemes um, but we have yet to see any progress on that and any support from the committee um, to, to, to help to progress that would be much appreciated. Okay, thank you. I mean, Joanna, Sinead, sorry, I don't want to cut across you, Sinead, but we need to bring Claire in because we're running out of, of time. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Thanks, Sinead. Can we bring Claire into the spotlight, please? Uh, good morning, Chair. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Joanne and Heather. Um, I, I, Joanne, I want to come back to your comments in relation to furlough. I've been uh, raising this with both the Finance Minister and the Minister of the Economy in relation to those costs of furlough. And that's not just the cost that we can expect because furlough has now been extended, but also the costs of employer contributions. You know, you were right to say earlier that some uh, employers are experiencing zero, zero income, so even those small costs compared to what they would normally be, um, are quite significant for them. And I suppose I have a concern for employees in that respect because it's those um, uh, employees that haven't been with the business as, as long as maybe uh, longer term employees that will be the easy targets in, in terms of redundancy because obviously redundancy costs will be less uh, the, the, the less time the employee has been with the business. So I, I've been trying to encourage you know the, the Northern Ireland executive to find a way of supporting uh, those furlough related costs um, um, because I do think it, it, it could be quite a small pot of money, but it can ensure uh, businesses uh, retain their staff. Just wondering if you have any thoughts in relation to that. Um, no, absolutely, because the last thing that businesses want to do is get rid of people, um, because we do know that we will come through this and we will grow, and as has been said before, the skills that we've got, um, you know, are they're, they're, you know, they're, they're really important to the business to grow. Um, so I think the support, if there is to be able to be some support as the business grows, because again, obviously we want to get open as quickly as possible, um, but obviously in the safest way, so that businesses can start bringing staff back off furlough, but um, as, you, as you say, you're not able to bring everybody back on day one and um, because it is going to take time just to, to build that business so i suppose this comes into the discussion as well around um the continued support so even though we're open it doesn't mean that everything is 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 a priori you know there is going to be a requirement for further support and also for a lot of people who you know we think the furlough scheme is really good and it has been really good but people are going to get 80 percent um, of their salary and i don't think any of us would like to see a 20 percent pay cut um, so, so there is there is something there, and, and again, um, I would encourage businesses as well to utilise um, all of the um, training and skill support that they that they can continue to develop their staff. But I have to say, talking to a lot of businesses, they really have and continued that engagement with staff. And um, this has been very challenging for everybody. Um, but again, support to ensure that um, you know we don't. Need to, we don't want to see any more redundancies. Um, I think would be would, is it is absolutely something that we fully support. Okay. So Thank thanks, you, uh, thanks, Joanne and Claire, and apologies, Claire. No, um, I'm fine. Um, we're just a wee bit yeah, over okay. time. So um, thank Chair. you. Sorry, Chair, can I just say, obviously I appreciate the time constraints, but if um, anybody from the committee just would like a you know one-to-one -one briefing or has any questions, I'm obviously more than happy um, to, to communicate in any way that, um, that is needed. No, thanks very much for Joanne, and um, I appreciate the, the, uh, that invitation and, and obviously um, engagement with yourself over the past while as well. So we appreciate both of your time this morning, um, so we, and we will be following up on a few actions out, out of the briefing. So thank you. Um, can we bring into the spotlight then, please, um, Paul Grocott and um, Michelle Scott and Louise Long, please. And members, so we're moving on to item number five, which is the briefing on the Economic Recovery Action Plan. There is a clerk's memo at page 73. Um, the recovery plan itself is at page 79. And if I hand over to the officials to make a statement and then we can open it up to members for questions. 
Yeah, hi. Good, good morning, Chair. Can you just checking you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can, Paul. Yep. Perfect. Uh, just, just to let you know, um, uh, Louise is at a all party parliamentary group briefing about um, uh, the impact of COVID on women. So Ian's joined us instead of Louise. Bring Ian Fleming. Okay, difference. I'll, I'll just provide a, um, a, a brief sort of summary of the context and positioning of the recovery action plan, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Michelle to give you a. Very quick run through the high level documents. We, we won't talk for too long because obviously the document's been yeah. published and, and you have it and you can get into, into questionings on it. So, um, just as, as a, a general update on how we've um, we've structured our policy response in, uh, in three phases. Uh, and, and this is necessary because uh, people, businesses, and places will feel different impacts in different phases. So, therefore, the policy response has had to reflect those changes and directly uh, in, engage with it. Inevitably, there is some overlap between the phases, but, but broadly, we've worked on the uh, principles that we'll be moving through uh, a response phase, which is still very current, into a recovery phase, and then on into a renew phase. And the action plan that we've published is very much positioned in that middle phase, that recovery phase. So you'll be, you'll have seen language in there that talks about kickstarting, rebuilding, and unfolding events, and that's very much trying to dock into the the economic exam question that we're expecting to see in that recovery phase. Um, also on positioning, um, this is a contribution towards an executive wide policy response. Um, uh, so we are at official level and both at ministerial level as a, a, an active area of engagement where we're looking to bring that together from all departments and, and pieces together, as I said, into a, an executive wide response. Through that engagement and through that process, we'll expect to see um, a product that facilitates decisions on allocations um, and, the, uh, and, and budget allocations for individual interventions. Um, but we, we fully appreciate that demand for businesses um, and people um, to bring this uh, document to life as quickly as possible uh, and, and to put these, these interventions into the economy as, as quickly as possible so they can start have uh, immediate impacts. And the, the final point me on positioning is that this is very much part of our ongoing conversation both with you as the committee but also for our stakeholders uh, and, the, and the reason it's picked this part of the conversation is because we've asked so quickly uh, it's minded to back to uh, uh, FDR uh, Roosevelt talked about the demand uh, in the public old and persistent tradition. We hear that demand at the moment, you know, that, that demand exists for action. Um, and as a result of that, we've had to move them up quicker. Back in action. You know, and we are here with you today, you know, as much in listening mode. So it's, we're keen to get your input on where you think the, the, the action plan stands up or where you think there's um, areas for improvement where we can sort of build stuff in uh, as much as we are to uh, so questions on a specific detail. So that's a very high level of where the document sits. I just I'll let Michelle now just get give a, a very high level um, run through of the documents. Uh, so Michelle, over to you. Oh Michelle, I think you're on, on mute. No. Is that me now? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Apologies. Um, well, thank you, Paul, um, and thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to come along today and talk to you about the Department's Economic Recovery Action Plan. Um, as members will be aware, and I've, as we have discussed at the committee, the Department published Rebuilding a Stronger Economy in the summer, and this document set out at a high level the priorities um, for a more competitive, inclusive, and greener economy. Um, the purpose of the Recovery Action Plan is to set out the immediate action required to deliver against that agenda and the actions required to project and stabilise employment. Um, members will also be aware that the department has been working in the recovery space for some time um, and I came along and spoke to you, gosh I think it was in the autumn, um, about the bids that we had been placing through the in-year monitoring rounds um, to further that recovery agenda. Um, so we have already mobilised um, a, a significant amount, amount of interventions in the recovery space, not least um, in the skills area. Um, so as I say, the recovery action plan sets out the work that needs to be done, that, that has been done to date in this space. And I think that, that was important within the plan, um, just to set out, look, actions have been taken um, while recovery, um, and, and I will put 
put our hands up and say it was difficult to judge the timing for recovery. Um, whenever I spoke to you, and I would say I think it was in the autumn, we wouldn't have anticipated we'd be sitting here in March um, with business still still closed, still operating under the, under those health regulations. Um, so the, the, the recovery action plan considers the interventions that will be required in, say, the next 12 to 18 months. Um, but I just want to be clear that that's not set in stone. Uh, and by the nature of the interventions within the recovery action plan, some of them will be longer term. And the, the, the classic example is skills interventions, um, some of which are obviously based on, on a long, longer time horizon. Um, so within the, the economic recovery plan, um, and, and as members will, will have noted, um, our interventions are regated within four key themes, um, R&D innovation, skills, investment trade and exports, and greener economy. And they will be familiar um, to all committee members as key drivers of economic growth. Um, members will note that on page eight of the recovery action plan, we've set out the additional funding that will be required under each of the four themes to deliver um, the recovery action plan. And it, it, it will, won't have been lost on members, but that looks quite unbalanced um, in terms of a very high financial ask against investment, trade and exports. And that is because within that theme is the high street stimulus scheme, um, which as, as members will be aware is it is a high, high cost, um, high intensity intervention to stimulate demand um, on our high streets. So also in reviewing the plan, it is important to notice, note, as Paul said, this is, this is part of an ongoing, continuing and evolving conversation. Um, these interventions will evolve, will change over time as we respond to what is an unfolding um, economic crisis and health crisis. Um, so the final point I wanted to make, and, and Paul had mentioned this, is the recovery action plan is focused on that recovery space. So within it, you won't see the interventions on, on the intense sort of life support grant schemes that are being rolled out. Um, and that is because it, it, it is considered as a separate phase to, to bring this forward. We have focused just in that recovery space, but a lot of these interventions will be layered on top of that lifeline intervention. Um, so really, that, that, that's just a very quick run through. I'm more than happy to, to, to get to questions and conversations now about the plan. Hey, um, thanks both of you for the, the overview there. Um, it's just to get. Um, and I, I welcome what you have said there in respect of it being part of, of an ongoing conversation and um, the, the committee has the opportunity to, you know, to feed in and to, to respond as well. Um, I think that across the broad themes of, of the, the recovery plan, I don't think anybody would, would disagree with the, the broad themes and um, I think the important or the focus on skills is particularly important and, and it has been a priority for the committee over the past number of months in terms of, of our work as well. Just to, to pick up on the final point that you made there, Michelle, just around how this links to the, you know, the kind of current phase where we are with, uh, as you described, the life support measures. Um, I guess there is a bit of a transition from that survival phase into recovery phase as well. Um, and I'm just wondering about the, the type of interventions maybe to support businesses to safely reopen. And, you know, we've seen some of this last summer in terms of support through councils and things like that for businesses to you know put in place some safety measures and and things like that but also in terms of the, the likes of invest ni's digital capability um grants and how is all of that kind of linking up from taking businesses to where we are now where it is very much life support and survival to beginning to be able to rebuild and to, to regain the capacity that they had um prior to the you know the, the lockdown situation well, I, I think I'm you know, reviewing the plan, you'll notice there is a very broad range of interventions within the plan, um, some of which are, you know, if we're looking at a spectrum, more on that intense support. That, 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 to be frank, five to ten years ago, um, it, 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 in a good economic backdrop, we probably wouldn't have been providing support to, but we're responding to a very unique situation. Um, so there is more intense support within the Recovery Action Plan for this initial phase as as people move out of those restrictions and, and move to back towards a more normal operating environment. Um, you had mentioned the e-commerce, the e-digital selling intervention there, and that is an example um, of what probably, to, to be frank, we wouldn't do in normal times, but it's to assist those businesses adapt to, to a very a very unusual um, operating model and accelerate what is, what is a normal 
evolution of the economy anyway as, as we move on to um, online selling, albeit it has happened at a, at a considerably accelerated pace over the last 12 months. Um, so how, how I like to, 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 to almost visualize this is it's a staircase um, and the steps getting more narrow as we go up towards a longer term economic vision for, for, for Northern Ireland. But we're at the stage now where we do have some more intense interventions um, just, just as the economy finds its feet again. Okay, no, thanks for that. Um, and I, I also am glad to hear that this is part of, I suppose, the executive wide approach to, re to recovery because it's a criticism I would have had of the, of the strategy that it didn't bring together kind of um, the cross departmental approach to it. And, you know, that's really important in, in certain aspects of, of recovery to have the kind of cross departmental buy in. And if, if we look, for example, to the, the green recovery piece that, you know, there is a, a number of departments that really need to, to buy into to um, anything that is proposed in, in that space. And so it, I'm glad to hear that it's part of that, that broader conversation. Just to suppose in that um, in the, the green recovery piece, um, is there plans to develop that out a bit more? Uh, you know, there is a particular focus on, on hydrogen, which is you know one particular um, aspect, and that I guess there is potential there to to develop upon. But in terms of, I suppose, bringing together various aspects of recovery around skills development, um, you know, giving young people the opportunity to to gain to gain skills that are going to be in those kind of developing sectors around the green economy. Uh, and there was the commitment in New Decade, New Approach to the Green New Deal. Has that been part of a conversation between departments in terms of economic recovery to move forward with the, the Green New Deal approach? Thanks, uh, John. If, if, if I pick up on the start, I, I think that sort of... Uh, that illustrates the, the connectivity between the, the, the phases, and particularly in that, in, in, in that aspect, it's the connected and, and overlap between the recovery and renew. And you know, in, in some ways, it's artificial to draw the lines between them, but it just makes it much easier for us to de define the policy response. So, I think what you'll see here is, as Michelle mentioned, that um, we put that 12 to 18 month time frame that is will be a movable phase. But that ha there has to be overlap and integration into both what the department's doing on the skills strategy and the energy strategy to set that wider strategic context and that uh, that longer term goal, and then also bring it back into an executive wide process. And that the real value that we have from that, because we've moved so quickly, we've not had the opportunity to draw the dots and the lines between um, what we've set out as a, 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 a recovery and what other departments are going to be doing. So um, the real value is that. As integrating and as part of the executive processes, we can draw those links, particularly, for example, between um, the skills interventions that we have here and the activities that have been developed by colleagues and part of the communities. And similarly, they are doing some exciting work on green growth and the huge overlap between what they're doing and, and, and what we've set out here, both in terms of the, the green growth strategy, but what their colleagues are going to set out in the uh, forthcoming energy strategy as well. No, no, I appreciate Michelle, is it? Is, oh, sorry, no, yeah, I was just going to ask you if, if I missed any technical detail that Michelle wanted to pick up, sorry. No, I, I mean, I, I, I think just the only thing what I, I would add, you know, obviously the greener economy is a, is a really exciting opportunity for the Northern Ireland economy. And, and what we have in there is, is almost a, a, a foothold and whenever I, I, I know I want to use my staircasing an analogy in this, but it, you know, we, we would see a, a significant amount of development in that area. Over the over, over the coming um, months and years, um, and obviously, whenever whenever we look at that executive level um, recovery plan, um, there is a huge amount of um, cross cutting issues that emerge from that. Um, it not only cuts across the other things within our recovery action plan, but obviously, it's cross cutting with a number of other departments. Um, so, so that will be built upon through that process. No, I, I would completely agree with that, Michelle, and I, and I think that it is important that we, we kind of plan to take advantage of whatever opportunities that there are there for, for new jobs and investment in that space. Um, I'm going to try and keep um, brief to, because other members um, want to get in and we are short on time today, but just I suppose one final point. Um, you know, in terms of addressing the, the productivity challenges we face in the north, one of the things that is continuously highlighted is the, the need to address um, low pay and, and secure work and there is the NDNA commitments around workers rights and employment and there's no particular reference in, the, in this document to um, those aspects of uh, 
of the recovery. So I was just wondering, is the department looking at that in terms of fulfilling those commitments in terms of a new decade, new approach? Yeah, the, um, colleagues are looking to pick that up. I don't have that with me, um, that briefing, but we can come back to you, provide you an update of where that's got to in terms of feeding into it. There's, there's a whole process that pieces together the executive's response to NDNA. And um, so there will be an update, um, which unfortunately I don't, I don't have. Michelle, is there anything else that we've got through the, the process of bringing this together that um, would be helpful to share? I would say there, there is there is ongoing work um, within the department. Um, the difficulty with this action plan, well, the difficulty, the, the because it's focused very much on the immediate actions, it doesn't capture a huge range of activities that are, that are being taken um, in normal times across the department. So there may be some overlap there, um, but certainly we can come back. Excuse me, we can come back with um, some more detail on that. But I do know there, there there is a body of work being taken forward. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can I bring Paul? It'd be good. Sorry, 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 sorry Chair. It'd be interesting to know um, if, if, if you come to us for. Um, 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 Right to us, and we can give you the detail. Is linking the um, the, the right set element to the productivity challenge because, um, you know, particularly in that re renew phase, you know, making the, the economy more productive and more competitive has to be at the, the core of that. So, if there's if the committee has views on where there's key policy interventions that can drive that productivity and competitiveness, then we would be interesting to to hear that. Um, I appreciate that, Paul, and, and we we can look at that. Um, can I bring Paul Given into the spotlight, please? She might work. I think we could do quite a bit on that. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Just one quick question for me in terms of the importance of foreign di direct foreign direct investment. Um, I know that the ARC twenty one um, waste facility uh, comes to around two hundred and forty million pounds. Uh, how important is that project, uh, would it be, and foreign direct investment as part of this plan? I have details on that investment, uh, I'm afraid. Well, um, Michelle, did you? I'm afraid I can't speak specifically to that project. I mean, yeah. obviously, Paul, um, FDI is a is a key component of the recovery action plan, and very very keen to bring in additional investment into the Northern Ireland economy as part of that recovery. But we can certainly um, provide more detail on that specific mm -hmm. project if that would be helpful. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thanks, Paul. Um, nice and brief. Can we bring Shanir into the spotlight, please? Good morning. Thank you very much, Paul and Michelle, for your briefing this morning. And, and um, it was great to see the, the document published um, there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, very welcome to have it. Um, in relation to, I just want to talk about funding. Uh, there's an indication that uh, an additional £290 million is, is required in order to deliver, deliver some of the key aspects of this recovery plan. Uh, and you've broken it down, £20 million R&D uh, and innovation, £50 million for highly skilled and agile workforce, £20 million for a greener economy, and £200 million for investment. Um, trade and exports. That 20 million for the greener economy sounds, um, you know, not a very big stretch. Uh, you know, according to the aspirations within the document and what actual money is going to be put against it, there seems to be a, a significant mismatch. And also in, in there, it indicated that um, this will include. The cost of delivering a high street stimulus package of that's going to cost 140 million pounds. Um, and again, I have reservations, and I, I've put them on record here about the nature and structure of that high street stimulus package um, and who it actually uh, reaches out to uh, and who actually benefits from it. So uh, I, I will state that again uh, quite categorically but if you compare that to the money that we're putting in for the green economy it seems to be really um really just uh, not good enough not adequate when you think of what scotland is putting in for the a 10 uh, a 10 year plan like two billion pounds uh, in order to drive their green economy um you know we're, we're falling really short at it there um so i would like to kind of think about that 
and also based on the high street stimulus package and we all uh, remember the joint uh, to help out uh, program that happened last summer Chris Woody yesterday quite categorically said that there is an expectation of another wave towards the end of summer uh, 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 and the beginning of, of autumn do we really want to be putting stimulus packages like this in the high street at the moment yeah, thanks. If, if, if I pick up on the high street scheme first, then we'll, we'll come back to the green economy piece. So, yeah, um, well, I, I was at the session uh, with Richard Ramsey, so we we, um, we had a, a really helpful discussion about the, the structure. And uh, my recollection is that we there was agreement about the purpose of the scheme. Absolutely, this is about you know it, it's high streets in Northern Ireland that, that need the support. Uh, there's a question about how you secure that. And then, if you um, you know, if you choose to purposefully exclude shops, there are unintended consequences, both in terms of the shops can be used, but people use the card. So that's the policy choice and decision that we had a pretty active discussion on, and that uh, our minister and, and writing to the executive, they'll have to make the decision on. Um, it was encouraging to see the high street support scheme mentioned in the uh, executive pathway as a, as a key lever in order to support businesses transition out of I think we may have lost. You've been considered that they in line with the public health guidance, which is why we, because we've not done the now because the uh, shops are closed, but also delivering it as soon as the shops open would be the wrong thing to do for the lessons that you've talked about um, just there. So it's it's still absolutely the intention. I think when, when the time is right, this will be a, a really important intervention to help our high streets stimulate demand. Uh, whenever we speak to the trade bodies, the chambers of commerce or, or businesses themselves, they're incredibly supportive of it, but recognise the timing has to be right. And you know, that will be a decision at executive level you know, with, the, with the public health advice playing a, a, a prominent role. Um, on, the, on the green energy, and uh, Michelle, please come in um, uh, as well, is uh, so the green economy, I, I think, important to recognise the time frame that Talking about this is, a, uh, as Michelle mentioned, this is a, a, a relatively short period of time when you're considering our journey to net zero. It also needs to be packaged together as part of an executive wide response that, you know, the greener economy isn't just, I would play a hugely important role, it's an executive wide responsibility, and other departments will, I, I'm confident, when they bring forward their similar plans for recovery and that piece together into an executive wide paper, will have significant contributions here. So you'll, you, you'll start to see, I'm sure, the quantum of funding that you'd expect to see or comparable to what Scotland have put on the table. And then in the longer term as well, when we bring forward the energy strategy that will have a, a much longer term um, sort of a pathway on our journey to net zero, which again, will probably start to look more familiar with what Scotland might have published. Michelle, is there anything else you'd like to add on, uh, on the greener uh, intervention? I just think an important point as well in terms of those costings, um, that is the additional funding required on top of our baseline. So there are interventions um, within all the themes and within the greener economy that will be funded um, from existing departmental monies. And I know there, there, there was, and I can't remember which one off the top of my head, I apologise, there was one of the greener economy interventions, so actions that we were able to fund um, from within our capital baseline. So it's... It, it's just to make the point that that is not the totality of what we propose to do in each of the things over the next 12 to 18 months. This is just this is the additional funding that will be required to layer on top of that. And as Paul has said, once once the um, collegiate response across the executive is pulled together, particularly on such a cross-cutting issue, such as the greener economy, that figure will increase again. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Paul, just one quick question. In relation to after the 31st of March, um, the, the support programmes that are going to be rolled out, can you give us any update? Because businesses are quite anxious as to what support um, they're going to receive after that date, after that financial year, because nothing is on the record yet. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the position that uh, business. And unfortunately, that's an executive level decision that I can't provide uh, further update on that ministers need to come together and decide on the, uh, the future support package going forward and the availability okay. of the funding to, to finance that. As well. Okay, I believe we're meeting Thursday, so hopefully we'll have some information there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sinead.
Can we bring Christopher into the spotlight, please? Hello, hello there, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Thanks, and thank you for your presentation. I think one of the things that is really, really important um, is that uh, accompanying the action plan is going to need to be in order to give businesses and the economy some sense of hope is going to need to be um, dates, frankly, a timeline of when we can start easing things. And I'm just wondering, not only in terms, just in terms of the department's position, uh, is a, a timeline, a dated timeline, going to be published? And um, secondly, uh, I think it's increasingly becoming important that the, the relevant data should be published now. Uh, last week, the Minister for Health, I think, got himself into a bit of trouble when he said the data was too complex for people to understand. But I think more than a year into lockdown, people should be getting access to that data to allow them to see what information is being used by the government to determine these positions. So dates and data, if you've got some views on that, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear them. Yeah, so this, this document sits separate to the pathway that the executive published, and that's purpose, purposefully so, that we, uh, we didn't want to blow those lines, and it's, it's positioned um, you know, on the assumption that the restrictions that are currently in place are significantly reduced, and therefore businesses are to trade, and they need support in that transition from the, the current position into the recovery. So it doesn't, it doesn't comment on uh, the restrictions or dates when those restrictions may be lifted. The, the, the pathway is out there, it's published. The, the, the view of the business community has been well known. Um, there is a, a official working group, official led working group on um, how that pathway becomes sort of put into action uh, uh, and when you might see sort of particular stages, uh, well, what you might see in particular stages, and that's sort of that's live and ongoing. Um, it will include stakeholder engagement. So, you know, we're very keen, for, particularly from our perspective, for the business community to feed in. And you've got some, um, some, some, some really helpful evidence from Joanne and, and Heather earlier on about the need for businesses to have that timeline to prepare. You know, it can't just be instantly. So I think that stakeholder feedback into and those reviews, what those review sort of milestones will do and, and, and the decisions that they're likely to take at those points are, are important. But there's, um, there's no further detail that I can share above and beyond that, I'm afraid, at the moment, uh, Mr. Stalford. Okay. Um, I know uh, yesterday in the House, um, I asked uh, the Minister a question about um, basically easements around florists and what have you, and the Minister was able to detail that uh, she had sought to put in place a click and collect arrangement for independent retailers florists, but this was rejected by um, the remainder of the executive. Just wondering, do you have an idea, if you could give me an idea of just how many other suggestions of easement around economic lockdown has the department submitted and have any of them been accepted? Uh, so I mentioned official like working group, which is sort of, um, uh, chaired by TEO, which we're actively involved in. Um, so through that, you know, we, we are bringing our economic analysis to provide a, as much support to colleagues in TEO as possible. How you would structure uh, executive level decisions to ensure that you know, as ministers are presented with those review points, they have uh, the maximum amount of information available to them. Uh, particularly in terms of sensible sequence, but also the economic impacts of restrictions, because it's 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 essential that that is a you know a, a key part of the evidence that ministers use to, to make the decisions at those particular milestones. Um, but I don't have a uh, I don't have a record of um, our ministers' contributions at the executive, uh, not least because they're confidential and there's no reason why I would have them. Yeah, I think um, not necessarily. I don't need a. I'm not looking for a hand sort of. Of the executive, what I'm trying to establish is that the minister said in the house yesterday that she had suggested, in, in relation to florists, independent florists, she had suggested this one particular easement. I'm just wondering, um, presumably, those common the, the suggestions that are made at the executive come in the form of papers prepared by the department. And I think it would be interesting for the public to know just the scale of easements 
that the economy department has suggested, which have been vetoed by the other parties in the executive, because I think the public have a right to know that, and I think it's important um, going forward. Just in relation to um, the high street, I welcome the the provision that you've made because uh, and the the suggestions in the document because it is quite apparent that um, that florist thing that I raised yesterday just one example of it. So Mother's Day on Sunday, um, my kids want to buy a bunch of flowers for their mother. They can do it in Tesco or they can do it in Asda. But the independent florist hasn't been allowed to open for more than a year. And the independent retailer on the high street is basically getting screwed to the floor. Meanwhile, the huge multinationals are um, profiting from this situation. Like I expect at the end of the year, Tesco, Asda and all of the... And they're, look, those are good and important companies too. They provide lots of jobs. I'm not bashing them as such. But I have no doubt that their profit margins are going to be up. And I think it is really important that the drive now needs to be getting as much of the economy open as quickly as possible. Because given the the massive success that the vaccine rollout has been, and we were told by other ministers, the rollout of the vaccine was our route out of this. And given the massive progress that's been made in that regard, I don't really think we can afford to delay anymore or drag our feet on freeing up our economy. But look, that's more of a, it's more of a statement than a question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Can we bring John Stewart into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, I've still got no camera, so I'll be going now. Um, thanks, folks, again, for the presentation so far. Um, really enlightening, I think. Uh, I'll echo the Chair's and other comments just to say that this uh, document is well welcomed. Um, Picked many of the boxes as a committee and the stakeholders have been highlighting um, that need to be addressed. And I suppose what we look forward to is putting the meat onto the bones as this develops and, um, and remains a live document. And I suppose that's the one question I want to get just to tease out um, initially is just how important you think there is to have continuity in this. I made the point during my contribution about the skills strategy is that we quite often see recovery documents and economic strategies being produced. And then a year or two down the line, another one's produced and the previous one's dumped. You know, I do think it's so important, given the, the, the impact that um, the economy has suffered as a result of COVID and everything else, that we have a strategy that we stick to over successive mandates. Um, that will be the same across many other um, strategies within the department and across other departments in, in the assembly. And also that collegiate approach, um, doing away with the old silo mentalities, a lot of this will be predicated upon work um, overlapping with other departments. Just how key do you think that is to have that continued live document and live strategy for economic recovery? Uh, yeah, yeah I, so I completely agree. I, I think um, the, the common theme of, sort of uh, criticism of strategies is the policy churn isn't helpful. Uh, and I, I think this is where we need to connect this, the phases. So it, it's really important, and, and the minister is will, will be bringing it forward hopefully shortly. I'm keen to speak to the committee about it as well. Is what does what does that long term future for the Northern Ireland economy look like? And that sort of sets a marker down into the future, uh, and and that needs to be consistent. That you know what we say in that needs to hold um, sort of, uh, through the years, and you need to be able to draw a line back to that. So these the recovery action plans, so the steps that we're taking now have to be leading us on that path. The challenge I think that we're going to face is that um, you know, in, in ordinary times, you'd be able to sort of have an implementation plan that followed that path. The challenge in this current context is that there will be unfolding events that today we don't expect that we will have to respond to. So the recovery action plan is going to have to do two things. It's going to have to lead us on that journey towards that fixed point in the future, but also very quickly react to events as they unfold. And, and that will be the challenge as policymakers. That's the challenge that we're facing. And, uh, you know, and, and also the challenge with our delivery agencies that they need to be able to move very quickly, I expect, in order to react and respond to events and provide the interventions that are absolutely necessary. And Michelle, is there anything you wanted to add to that? In terms of now, I suppose that this goes back to the, to the point I made earlier, um, that the recovery action plan really is 
a broad spectrum of interventions and within that plan you will see particularly in, in, in the skills and, uh, and innovation but really across all things um, the footholds of a longer term economic strategy so building those skills of those high profile uh, sorry, high, high priority sectors um, working with um, partners to, to to, to build the attractiveness of Northern Ireland as a destination for both tourists and, and, and investment. Um, so, so there are a lot of longer term, while they're short term interventions, um, they are the footholds of a longer term economic strategy. Now within there as well, you also have some more reactive, responsive interventions that are very specific to the current crisis. Um, and, and that will be a challenge um, to keep this document live, keep it responsive and reactive to, to, to unfolding situations whilst also having an eye on that longer term economic, economic strategy for Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Michelle. Um, I think those foothills will be key over long term, um, definitely in terms of long term strategy and, and, and growth. And that will be the challenge, without doubt. But I think back to the original point which he's agreeing with is it continually changing it and it's not not labour and blame it yourselves but it just seems to be a theme across governments everywhere that every couple of years is another bright idea and there was probably nothing on the previous one it just hadn't been given time um so if the economy and businesses like certainty and i think that if we could give them some through a, a sustained strategy that would be very, very beneficial um i think as a committee chair probably you know we could spend an entire committee meeting on this document um, discussing it, I know, and I don't want to put our guests through that today. So maybe there is an opportunity going down the line that we could sit and tease out more of it and maybe put together a more full committee response. I think that would be beneficial for engagement with stakeholders as well. Um, the one last point I want to make is just to echo um, the vice chair's comments around that need for ongoing certainty in the absence of any clarity about when certain sectors can reopen. And we hope that they're given some um, good news, maybe the next announcement next week. But in the absence of that, there is that uncertainty about whether financial support will continue. And Paul, if I could just maybe stress that through to the department or the minister, I know it might require the executive to tee something up as well, but um, we need some clarity on it. If I could just get that on the record, that would be helpful. I don't need a response. Thanks for your time today, folks. Thanks, John. Can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Well, Chair, and uh, thank you to everyone for your presentation thus far. Uh, in, in relation to long-term planning, there are three events that are going to impact on the global economy. Well, certainly two in the global economy, and one, another one on our economy and a uh, broader scale. COVID, uh, climate change, and Brexit. And all of those events are going to mean that companies, large and small, are looking at their supply chains on how they continue to manufacture or create the, the industry or services they're involved in. Um, which brings me on to the point I want to make. Within the recovery plan, what account has been taken to the fact that we now have a new trading reality? Uh, and the Assembly passed a motion two weeks ago uh, in relation to this, that recognising the new trading reality that we're in after the tr Brexit transition period has now ended. Um, with the deal with the protocol, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and only last week I heard of a company that had a £30 million order that it was looking to fill and was looking at local suppliers to fill that. So how is this economic recovery plan, or how does it fit into those new realities, including the protocol? Yeah, but the, the, the section on trade that, if you, you strip out the High Street um, stimulus scheme, there's around £60 million. Um, worth of interventions, and, and they're absolutely rooted in the, in the, the, the adjustments that need to be made as a result of COVID, Brexit, including the protocol and, and climate change for the business community. How do you uh, adjust and adapt to that? But not only that, because standing still isn't good enough in the current climate, you need to be able to identify where there's competitive opportunities to build competitive advantage. So it's the, you know, there's, there's a whole package of measures there that are absolutely focused on supporting you know, businesses here adapt, adjust, and build that competitive advantage. Michelle, is there, are there any specifics that is worth bringing out in terms of you know, John's question about that, that, those three existential issues? 
Well, well certainly those three issues um, have been at the heart of our considerations for, for, for this um, recovery action plan. Um, on the trade and exports, there, there are, if it, as Paul said, um, both in the skills theme and in the exports theme, um, there are interventions aimed at um, helping the, the Northern Ireland economy adapt and adjust um, to a new trading reality. I mean, an, an, an example is there is an action to help people gain export and trade qualifications, um, just, just with, with the new regime that businesses will have to operate within. Um, that, 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 is, that is an ongoing action. Um, we also have actions that are looking at um, helping businesses strengthen and explore supply chains. Uh, and those are interventions that, that, that while are forward looking, that we have been working um, with investment um, on over the last year. Uh, and certainly obviously climate change and as well embedded in, in those other things um, like the, the, the skills and um, COVID goes without saying it, 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 it throughout the plan. But I think I think those are the, the, the three issues um, that certainly we are on saying policy colleagues are at the forefront of our mind as we develop the recovery action plan. And it's not only about companies seeking new supply chains, it's about companies becoming the supplier. Absolutely. It's about developing those supply chains um, to ensure our local businesses can service the demand within the economy and the businesses can, can, can ex lower alternative suppliers uh, as well. So yes, it's a, a great piece of way. Sorry, I probably was a bit casual in how I described that. And it's just a final point, um, economic recovery plans and economic policies can be high, very high for uh, uh, they have to be to a certain degree, but they have to mean something to, to workers and small businesses, which are the heart of our economy. So in terms of the economic recovery plan, what does it mean to the man or woman who got out of bed this morning, climbed into a cold work van, travelled down the country and go to stand and work for eight to ten hours until it gets dark? What, what, what in real terms does this mean for those people? It's a, in real terms, it's a £290 million investment to ensure that you know, if, if they're in work, that we can continue them to be in you know, prosperous and productive, productive work. And if they're unfortunate that they fall out of the labour market, that, that there is a sophisticated and well-developed support network to keep them as close to the labour market as possible, and therefore we, we avoid those long-term scarring effects that, unfortunately, this place is, is also familiar with. Okay, I'm conscious of time, but uh, I think it's worth a, a further discussion as well, so thank you. Thanks, John. Um, can we bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Can we bring Stuart Dixon in? Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, folks, I appreciate that part of this strategy includes uh, a greener economy for Northern Ireland and how we might work in relation to that. Do you have any information in relation to the public sector decarbonisation scheme, which the government introduced a year ago in the UK? Do you know whether that uh, one billion pound fund, uh, which actually comes to an end in October of this year, whether Northern Ireland received any of that money? And if it did, then what did we do with it? And if it didn't, do we ourselves have any plans around a public sector decarbonisation scheme? Because the scheme in England uh, has effectively given 100% grant aid to local authorities to bring uh, zero carbon or as near zero carbon footprints as they can to public buildings, leisure centres, libraries, uh, town halls, community centres up and down the country. What are we doing to try and match that, and why are we lagging a year behind? So I absolutely agree that there's, when we talk about innovation um, and research and development, R&D spending, uh, and also the drive expectations of our business community can drive that green growth. Those set in expectations need to be placed on the separate sectors. That's, that's at the heart of what we're doing, both in terms of thinking about what we're doing in recovery and also that, that longer term plan. 
I don't have a specific um, detail on a public sector decarbonisation scheme or whether we've drawn down any money. Michelle, I don't know if you know. Um, but if we don't, we can come back to you and, and provide that. Yeah. I, I, sorry, I can't speak specifically to the to, to whether or not we're going to borrow a consequential or bid into a fund. Um, I do know that um, there is uh, there's a proposal to develop an invest to save fund um, to finance investments in central government buildings to provide energy, carbon, and cost savings. Um, so that would be similar to the public sector decarbonisation scheme that they is introduced. Now, I, I can I, I can follow up on the funding certainly um, and find out just how how that operated at the time. I'm afraid I'm afraid I don't have that information in front of me. Yeah, because I mean I think in fairness a billion pounds is not an insignificant sum of money uh, in the UK, and uh, we've heard smaller figures where Northern Ireland has received a consequential. Uh, income for that, but it's disappointing to read that the scheme ends uh, in October of this year, and that local authorities, that the length and breadth of the UK, with the exception, I think, in Northern Ireland, because I certainly haven't noticed any local authority here uh, stepping up in terms of decarbonising their public facilities or other public bodies, for that matter. Um, so, I, I think it's a fair question to ask. Where is our share of that money? And if it went somewhere else, then what was the reasoning behind that? And just again to reiterate the question, I think it is important that uh, public buildings take a lead in all of this and that we should be seeking to see how we can fund them uh, to deliver that, that, that greener activity. Because but we set an example by doing that to, to, to other uh, businesses and buildings. Thank you. And of course, yeah, all the jobs that are created, all the jobs that are created as yeah. well. Uh, retrofitting buildings is very important uh, in terms of insulation and, and all of that. Well, absolutely. We'll, we'll come back to the funding, but as I said, that that invest to save proposal is within the recovery action plan. But 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 we'll come back to you on the money. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Sinead, you wanted to come back in for a quick question. Oh, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Yes, it's a quick uh, clarifying question, um, Paul, to yourself in, in relation to the funding required. You've indicated that 200 million is going to investment, trade, and exports, but 140 million of that is for the high street um, scheme. So, are you saying to me that? Almost 50% of the money, the £290 million, pounds, is going to a high street scheme. Because I, I, I'm a bit flabbergasted at how just short term that this, is, this investment is going to be. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a large percentage of that money could be spent in Tesco, in Sainsbury's, in Lidl, or wherever. Is that really where we want as a ratepayer? Like as a ratepayer, I'm not sure that's value for money uh, for me. And I'm just wondering, is, am, am I reading that right or have I got this completely wrong? No, so the, so the scheme is still pitched. That, so um, when we originally pitched the scheme, it was to load £100 onto cards for individuals, so, so for adult individuals across uh, Northern Ireland, it's a £140 million scheme. You know, look at um, where it's been. It developed. was ninety-five where, million pounds yeah. before Christmas. Sorry, it was ninety million pounds. So ninety-five it, it million. Was, it was, so it was it was allocated ninety-five million when we pitched the scheme. It was one hundred forty million. It was allocated ninety-five. So um, we weren't able to deliver the scheme in this year. So because we're using um, moving into the. the what will come in the next financial year. We reverted back to the original policy design. We think £100 loaded onto the cards, so they have the maximum impact. It's, it's easy for people to understand, um, at least. Um, in terms of uh, what will the policy do, it's absolutely designed to support local high streets. It's not designed to support multinationals. Um, and you know, a, a key a key aspect of that policy design, which we, we, we spoke about, is how do you achieve that? If you ex the multinationals that you mentioned, you need to be comfortable, A, that you have knock-off consequences of other local shops that would be categorised in that same category that you would perhaps want um, to support, but also you have to be comfortable that individuals that may choose to use the scheme for that purpose wouldn't be able to do so. So the, the advice that we're providing in a minute and the, the, and the discussion that we're having both with the committee and also with stakeholders is, you know, 
on that scale, where are the options between using quite hard choices and excluding people and, and then accepting their consequences or having a, um, a, a quite a sophisticated and hopefully effective communications campaign which targets uh, the spend in the areas that you want to want to see it spend. And then also working with the likes of the Chambers of Commerce to see how you can incentivize spend in areas. So for example, when we spoke to colleagues in Jersey, um, they found that local shops actually use the scheme to uh, add a, an additional uh, discount onto products. So for example, they would tell us about Circle Shop, they give you an extra £10 off if you use the card in the scheme. So that's another way of funneling and channeling people into areas where you want to see the spend. I mean, I don't discount that some people will want to spend this money on uh, on food, but that's a different type of scheme. And I keep on saying this, it's a different type of scheme. Uh, people that need money for food should get money for food. But that probably will come through, or should come through uh, the Department for Economy. And we should look at welfare mitigations and increasing the money for uh, universal credit. But certainly, I, I'm, I am really concerned when we're looking at recovery and rebuilding. I think we need to think long term instead of short term. And if we look at our high streets, we need a lot more investment in our high streets at the minute. We need, you know, pedestrianisation, we need new infrastructure, we need all sorts of things that are long term and lasting for the people in our communities. Uh, and to half of our, the recovery money, half 50% to go into a scheme. That, and, 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 and if we don't have it very robustly, we know where it's going to go. Right, well, I don't know. So when we're speaking to businesses, you know, you know they're absolutely about stimulating demand. So, so we've not had any negative responses when we've gone out and spoken to businesses about the scheme. It's exactly the type of intervention that they want to see. They want to see government money being used to incentivise people to get out onto the high street. And you know, in effect, what we're doing is putting 140 million into the local high streets. That's you know, that's that's what we're trying to do. And if the scheme works properly, you'll get the, the multiplier effect of people using more than the money on the car in the high street. And that's where you, you'll, you'll hopefully see them. Are you from when it comes to the scheme? And absolutely it's small dependent on our health. This is the, this is the only place where we get negative feedback on the scheme. Well, <laughs> it's just that it has to be really, really tight in how we we, we uh, put the eligibility and the criteria around it because if it's not, it'll not go to the high street. And that would be absolutely unforgivable in all of us if it doesn't go to the people that we want it to go to then it is not a successful project. Um, yeah, yeah, and listen, we, we completely understand that, and that's at the heart of the advice providing that we're, we're giving to ministers, and that will be what the minister presents to the executive, um, hopefully relatively soon. Thanks, Paul mm -hmm. and Sinead. Um, and I, I think, um, Paul, we, we might look to get some more information from you in relation to the High Streets voucher scheme as it develops. And, and obviously, there, there are important discussion points around all of that, and, and also in terms of the, the best support that can be given to businesses to help them um, to be able to reopen and to, to get that capacity back. But can I just ask one a final question just around that kind of contingency planning as well um just based on uh modeling because obviously we saw last autumn where you know a, a second wave was a um, model for and then the the uh the i suppose interventions weren't necessarily designed with that in mind and, and just would like to clarify that lessons have been learned from that and that contingencies are being planned for in respect of the, the recovery plans now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that speaks to Michelle's sort of point about this has to be a living document. You know, it, it will have to adapt and evolve depending on both the economic events that unfold in front of us, but also the prevailing public health advice at the time. I think that one of the lessons that we picked up is that the earlier where we can bring interventions forward, the easier it is for us to adapt during the course of the year. It's much harder to do that as you get sort of towards the end of the year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank the, the, the three of you for coming along this morning and, and for briefing us on the document. Um, and I, uh, members can uh, suggest some actions, but I think we're going to move straight into to our next briefing before we do that. So thanks, and, and Paul and Michelle and Ian for being with us, and I'm sure we'll have you back soon as well. Here's okay, members. Right, so thanks so much. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to um, agenda item number seven.
which is the departmental briefing on the SL1, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. There is a clerk's memo on this at page 137. The SL1 itself is at page 139. Um, and at our meeting last week, we agreed that we would seek a, a briefing on this as it is a significant policy, uh, sorry, policy change. Um, to the eligibility for home tuition fees. So can I bring into the spotlight, please, um, Heather Cousins, Head of Skills and Education Group in DFE, and Linda Meldrum, Skills and Education Group at DFE. And Heather, if I hand over to yourself, maybe to just give us a, a bit of a background brief, brief into this. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much for inviting Linda and myself along to brief you on the regulation applying to higher education courses. So by way of background, um, when the UK was in the EU and up to the end of the implementation period on the 31st of September 2020, we were part of the reciprocal arrangement between member states in relation to our higher education tuition fee charges and student financial support, which originated from the Free Movement Directive 2004-38. So after the end of the implementation period, those reciprocal arrangements are no longer in place. In terms of our student support and fee policy going forward, we had to fit our policy within the obligations set out in the EU withdrawal agreement, the EEA EFTA separation agreement in relation to Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland, and the Swiss citizens' rights agreement. And these agreements mean that persons from these countries living in the UK on the 31st of December 2020 have what are called protected rights and can continue to live and work in the UK and access services. Under Home Office rules, these persons with protected rights must apply under the EU settlement scheme and they will be awarded pre-settled or settled status depending on how long they have been living in the UK. We also had to take into account the Home Office new points-based immigration system under which new persons coming into the UK apply, irrespective of whether it is a new EU national coming into the UK or someone from the rest of the world. So effectively for new people coming to live in the UK, a French national is treated just like an Australian national, for example. Furthermore, the UK and ROI government signed a common travel area memorandum of understanding in 2019 which affords British and Irish citizens the right to access all levels of education and associated student support in each other's state on a reciprocal basis. So working within this framework, the policy is that for new EU students arriving in the UK and starting courses from September 2021, they will be treated like a student from the rest of the world and are no longer eligible for student support and the lower home fee charges unless they are settled in the UK, sometimes called indefinite leave to remain. Indeed, if we treated the French student differently than the Australian student, we would be open to legal challenge. The following students will continue to be eligible for student support. EU EEA Swiss nationals who started courses in academic year 2020-21 or are partway through their courses, they'll continue to be eligible for their student support and for home fee charges for the duration of their courses. For ROI nationals, the status quo will continue under the reciprocal common travel area arrangements, and they will continue to be eligible for student support and home fee charges. ROI nationals don't have to have been living in the UK on the 31st of December 2020 to qualify, nor are they required to have applied under the EU settlement scheme. For other EU EEA Swiss nationals who were in the UK <clears throat> at the end of the implementation period, i.e. those with protected rights under the withdrawal agreements, they continue to be eligible for student support, though they are required to have settled or pre-settled status under the Home Office's EU settlement scheme. Now, the regulations also make provisions for UK returners, that's UK nationals and their family members who've been living in the EEA who may wish to study in the UK. They are eligible for full maintenance and fee support and home fee charges for courses starting before the 1st of January 2028. And this policy was announced in 2019. 
Um, there will continue to be provision for EU nationals returning from the EEA to be charged home fees and get fee support, for example, if they return to start courses after 1st of January 2028. Um, also, the regulations make provisions for migrant and frontier workers, family members of EU nationals, and under Home Office rules, family members of persons of Northern Ireland who obtain settled or pre-settled status under the EU settlement scheme will be treated as having protected rights. This group is not covered by the EU withdrawal agreement, but under Home Office rules, they may apply to the EU settlement scheme should they wish to. We understand this Home Office policy has its origins in the Good Friday Agreement and the right of people of Northern Ireland to identify and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may choose. As a result, those with family member or person of Northern Ireland status will have access to home fee status and student financial support on the same basis as family members of EU nationals covered by, with, by the withdrawal agreement. Whilst this will make no material difference to the support package students are already entitled to, there is a very, very narrow uh, area of advantage over, say, an English national in similar circumstances. It relates to non-EU, non-UK, non-EU family members. For example, an Australian family member of a person of Northern Ireland. Had the Australian been a family member of an English person, they can only qualify for home fee status and fee loans if they had lived in the territory comprising the UK and islands for three years before the course starts. Whereas the Australian family member of a person of Northern Ireland is able to qualify in the former circumstances or if they have pre-settled status and three years in the much wider territory comprising UK, Gibraltar, EEA, Switzerland before the course starts. And persons living in Gibraltar are eligible for fee loans and home fee charges. And finally, I should say that England, Scotland and Wales have decided to adopt a similar approach. This means the reality is that if we were not able to make these changes, we would expect a huge increase in the number of EU students applying to study in Northern Ireland, um, potentially, since the maximum student number cap sets the maximum student number of students who could be charged the lower 4,000 home fees an increase in EU applications would inevitably displace our home NI students who wish to study here. And so more of our home Northern Ireland students would be forced to go to study in, in GB in those circumstances. So this leaves us with little choice other than them to follow a similar approach being taken in England, Scotland and Wales. And I realised that, that that was delivered at speed and it's quite a complex area. I don't profess to be the expert, Linda is the expert, so if any of your questions are technical and complex, I will invite Linda to, to answer the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Heather, um, and that has, has been useful in terms of giving us some greater clarity, but just to, give, just to clarify completely, there is no change for our students in the South, um, and that will be reciprocated by the, the government in the South for students from the North. And um, similarly, can I just ask to clarify that we have to make this change because otherwise we would be open to legal challenge from students in other countries outside of the EU. Is that That's correct. Interpreted? That's a nutshell, yes. Okay, to both of those that that's the case? Yes. Okay, and so can I just ask then a couple of questions around this because... Um, and. Just in relation to your final point, Heather, around around the MAS and, and EU students, can this be, for example, could this be decoupled? Could the fees be kept as, as what they are, but not included in the MAS? Um, and that's one question in relation to, could the universities decide not to charge full international fees to EU students? In the same way that they previously decided not to charge the £9,000 fees to um, students from Britain for, for a while and then they did, they did um, eventually move to that position. Um, perhaps I could invite Linda to, to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So the um, the second question was the uh, um, the the fee cap and regulations um, cap the maximum amount that the that the universities can charge. So um, for the for the new EU students coming in um, from September this year, um, people that haven't been living in the UK, um, the the universities um, they're not capped, so they can choose what to charge the students. Um, but they they could potentially leave themselves open for legal challenge if they treated uh, um, a new French student coming in differently than a new Australian student coming into the into Northern Ireland study. Okay, so thanks for that. Um... No, that, that's helpful in terms of understanding that. Can I just ask then, in relation to um, students from the north who choose to go and study in um, EU member states and the, the rights attached to their Irish passport, so passport rights for Irish citizens who live in the north, what is the situation in relation to that and fees? I, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. Perhaps Linda does. Well, I think um, I'm actually I actually am not sure, but I imagine they would be like us, and it would just be the nationality of the student, but where they'd been living as well prior. So um, it's up to each member state to decide their own policies going forward. Um, but the, once the UK left the EU after the implementation period, the reciprocal understanding um, that, you know, um, UK students studying in the EU, that reciprocal arrangement, you know, isn't in place anymore. But, um, so I would I would think probably most member states would have some sort of a, um, a but I just I just don't know what's in place in, in other member states. Okay. Apart from that, from the software, obviously, um, you know the status quo is continuing um, with the two-way movement between um, you know Northern Ireland students studying in the south and Southern students studying in the north. Okay because uh, similarly, I suppose, to the points that you have made in respect of students from elsewhere um, and uh, non-EU member states potentially looking to, to legally challenge if there was a differential in fees. Um, Irish passport holders are still EU citizens as well, so um, there is rights attached to, to that st status in terms of being able to, to access certain things, and I think we need to seek some clarification around the, the status of... of Students from the north with, with Irish passports in terms of being able to access um, courses in EU member states. So, P Peter, if that's an action that we could maybe take out of this. Um, can I bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, the points I, I wanted to raise have largely been covered, but just in, in the last point you raised there yourself. Uh, Will the status of an Irish passport holder be changed as a result of us passing this SL1 and regulation, or is that a, does that status be defined by the withdrawal agreement? So I don't know if you have the answer to that, but maybe that's something Peter maybe take as an action point uh, moving forward. I, th I think it's highly unlikely that this set of regulations would impact on the status of anyone's passport. No, I think those issues are issues that are wider withdrawal agreement issues that are not specific to these regulations. Okay, thank you. Okay, and can we bring Stuart Dixon into the spotlight? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, again, I think um, the, the areas of subjects have already been covered both by yourself and John. 
Um, and I don't even think I actually need to hold an Irish passport to claim Irish citizenship. Um, so, uh, and there have been a number of court cases around this, D'Souza and others. Um, so, I think, to be honest, Chair, that the committee will require further information. It would be my inclination not to support this today until we receive further information. Um, and it may very well be that the committee should seek legal advice with regards to all of this. It's a very complex area, uh, and I, I think we need further information before we can make a decision. Yeah, no, thanks, Stuart, and, and I agree. And I just wanted to ask, has the department sought any legal advice on it? And, and Stuart makes um, an important point there as well in respect of whether you claim your Irish citizenship or not. Every citizen in the North has the, the entitlement to it, um, if they so choose. So I guess it is an area that we, we need to just try and clarify. Ha, has there been any legal advice sought? Linda, perhaps you could clarify no, the legal advice. No, no legal advice has been sought, but the the issue, as I understand you're saying, is about the position or of our students uh, going to study elsewhere in Europe, um, and that's completely outside the terms of these particular regulations. Um, these regulations just don't allow um you know for students coming into Northern Ireland to study. Um, and uh, so I think they're two separate issues, but it is a it's a very valid question to ask. No but um we um don't give student support for um our Northern Ireland students going to study in the EU um, apart from obviously um our Northern Ireland students going to study in in, uh, in the ROI. Okay, no, and, and I appreciate the, the point that you're making. It's just, I suppose, that the reciprocation from other EU member states is, is where I, I guess we would have the, the question marks over. Can I bring Sinead McLaughlin into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Heather and Linda, for um, your trying to clarify this. I mean, I find it very difficult to understand, to be honest with you. And, and many students in uh, Northern Ireland, as you'll be well aware, actually go to Europe to study. Uh, I know a few students that are in the Netherlands, etc. Uh, and we do it because of uh, their EU membership, obviously, that has changed. But we really do probably need to know just exactly um, what value can be placed on their citizenship um, in relation to where they choose to study. Um, and, and I would need clarification on that. And I realise that this is really about incoming students. Um, but I do think that because it was a reciprocal arrangement, that we kind of need to understand just how it in totality uh, influences um, or impacts on, on all our students here. Um, and, and just to be clear, so home students are regarded as UK GB, all students GB, and all students ROI at the moment. Is that what you're saying? Um, students? Uh, home phase, sorry. Home phase, so students mm -hmm. who are eligible for home fees at the minute are um, are, uh, are are home Northern Ireland students and uh, they're also EU students as well coming to study in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, could, I, could we just clarify that students coming from England and Scotland to study in Northern Ireland are charged higher fees? And that will remain? Yes. Yeah. That will remain, yes. Yeah, yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. And what about students coming from ROI? They pay their charge home home fees. Yeah. To home fees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's great. No, that's that clears that up as well. Thank you. Um, Heather and Linda, thanks for the, the information and I think the committee is going to ha suggest some actions for, for us out, out of the briefing. So thank you for clarifying that for us this morning. Um, and members, if we maybe just decide what we're doing with that. Chair, um, just if I can come in on that. Um, 
clearly from, from what Linda and Heather have briefed, the uh, status of, of students from ROI has not changed. Um, under the, the CTA MOU, they will continue to be regarded as home students with home student fees. And the, the issue that's been uh, raised about um, students from here studying within other EU countries on their Irish passport or, or using their Irish citizenship, would they qualify for EU home fees? Uh, from, from what the officials have said, and I think it, it's, it's, it's understandable, is out with this particular set of regulations. The regulations only apply to students studying here. So, Chair, I think where, where the clarification probably lies now is how the EU and EU member states will respond to students from here who wish to study within the EU, exercising their Irish citizenship, and whether they would be viewed as home students within the other EU countries. And I think we Obviously, I, I appreciate Heather and Linda and the department can't answer that. That's probably a question for EU member states. So, Chair, what I might suggest is we write to the EU Commission regarding what, what that status actually is. Um, and, and I think just it might be worth members having another conversation around the SL1. I appreciate what the officials have said and, and um, they, they have indicated that as as committee had hoped or expected, um, the CTA MOU would mean that students from the south still have the same rights they had before, and those EU students who are already here or have settled status, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have not changed. So, in terms of the SL1, that's established. The unknown here goes, I, sus I suppose, beyond the SL1. So, if members are content, we will we will write to try and get clarification on the status of students from here uh, seeking to study in the EU using their Irish citizenship. Can I just ask members to mute themselves if they're, they're not speaking? Thank you. And yeah, Peter, if so members are content... If members are content, speak, just to find to that, that clarification, I appreciate in terms of what the officials have said, um, that, that's not necessarily part of this SL, but I think it's, it's just useful, Chair, right, right, right. to bring the SL1 back to um, the committee just, just for members to talk and clarify what exactly their understanding is. And um, Peter also, and I think a number of members also mentioned this as well, the, the wording of the SL1 isn't entirely clear, so could we maybe just ask that that is refined yeah, slightly we, just to... We'll talk to the department about that, Chair. Um, um, about what it means. Yeah. And then there is the, the related issue that, that Linda mentioned about um, students from here wouldn't have um, student support for studying in the EU unless they're considered um, students, as far as I understand. So if we also need to clarify that situation, but that will come secondary to clarifying the actual status of um, students from here studying in the EU member states, first of all. Okay, Chair, I'll take those actions away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, members, uh, we have a few minutes before we need to, to finish up here. So if we go now, oh, if we want to go back to the Economic Recovery Action Plan to agree our actions from that. Chair, there's, there's a number of things um, I, I want to maybe suggest coming out of that. Um, we, we'd be looking, Chair, members have suggested we look at further detail around the NDNA commitments that link through to the Economic Recovery Action Plan, and we'll, we'll see some clarification that there were some specifics mentioned, and we'll pin that down with the department. Also, um, seeking clarification on Mr. Given's question around the ARC 21 issue, I think the department can clarify who we need to ask around that. Um, additionally, we, we've um, we asked the department around the proposals that the Minister has made to the Executive around economic easements over the last six months or so, just to see what exactly those have been and, and, and what the Executive response has been. Chair, I'm also going to suggest we do a discussion event around the Economic Recovery Action Plan. Um, it would allow stakeholders to give members a view of what they think. Uh, if we do it in the style of the, the micro-inquiry discussion events we've had, if, if members are agreeable to that, I think it would just be really useful to get that feedback in a live session. Um, additionally, we'll ask for the department to clarify 
where we are in terms of fallout from the base decarbonisation scheme and, and what we're actually looking at that going forward into the new financial year. And more specifics on the high street um, voucher scheme. I'm also going to suggest, Chair, that in the discussion event with stakeholders, we have a specific question around that to hear their views. If members are agreeable to those actions. Yep, I agree. Chair, sorry, can I come in? Yep, go ahead, Sinead. Um, in relation to um, the, the recovery plan and action plan, it, it's, not, it's not really a long term recovery plan, uh, and I don't think that that's the intention. Uh, to be perfectly honest, so uh, I, I want to maybe um, tease out a little more about how it actually plays in some of our long-term objectives in relation to the Beckett new approach. I mean, there was real commitments that every party signed up for for delivery, uh, and there, there are gaps there. They're not mentioned uh, in the recovery plan, um, and I don't know if that's significant or important. Or is that a separate plan that we're going to see that in terms of the programme for government, which we have yet to see? Um, but you know, there, there, there are real gaps there, uh, and even uh, within the Green New Deal aspect, there's there are significant gaps there that um, it is left out. So, whilst it's an action plan and we're going to have some kind of plan, there, there are significant areas that we need to, to, to ensure are not left behind as well. Chair, hopefully we'll be able to, to clarify that when we do the um, the, the cross-check between the NDNA and the Economic Recovery Action Plan as to what we would expect potentially to see in that. I'm also really conscious, Chair, of the number of additional strategies that the Department's looking at that will have to um, fit in with the Economic Recovery Action Plan. Just off the top of my head, the skills strategy, the energy strategy, all the reviews um, involving skills levels, the four and five level review, the FE review, the HE review, there's a huge swathe of strategic policy development that's got to fold into this. And Chair, I suppose the other thing um, to flag up would be, members raised it a number of times during the briefing, was the actions that sit right across the executive. So Chair, it might be helpful if members are content to write to the executive office just to get that down as a as an action coming out of this that the, the committee is very conscious that the executive needs to roll in behind actually f delivering on this uh, economic recovery action plan so bringing it up to executive level highlighting that fact and probably then asking uh, the executive office to clarify what that process is, how, how other departments are going to feed into this. I think that's important to hear probably from the executive. Okay. Um, and yeah, and I suppose just to, to, I suppose, also communicate to the Minister that it's important that there is that cross-departmental approach to this um, action plan as well. And P Peter, Paul made a point in relation to the productivity challenges. Yeah. Um, I think it might be useful for us to put a bit of a focus on that particular aspect of work, I know that there, there has been significant work done in, in, in that space by the likes of Neary, so um, maybe there is a, a small um, inquiry or, or something, piece of work that could be done around that. Um, and I'm not sure what, what kind of time scale we're talking about for the event, um, the discussion event around the action plan, but if, if it could maybe be done quite soon, yeah, and it you, might sure. be very useful then to have the Minister respond to that event and we could invite the Minister in to discuss the action plan and the the outcome of um, a discussion event around it. Chair, absolutely. That, that's the most logical and sensible chain of events, so we'll plan on that basis of a discussion event followed by um, a ministerial briefing. I think the officials had, had raised the, um, the, the, the idea of a discussion with the Minister around the, the recovery action plan, so that would really facilitate that. So we, we'll go ahead and start planning in that direction, Chair. Okay. okay. Thanks, Members. Unless there's anything else, we'll, we'll move on. and Will we try and do anything else, Peter, or will we...? I think we may have to leave the room, Chair. 
Okay. Um, with the with the early shutdown day, they're, they're they're very rigid in getting in here and and preparing for the next committee. And I, I'm I'm conscious um, of the fact that we have another SL1 yep. that we would have um, ideally got to today that also has a number of questions attached to it. But I'm thinking if we leave that, I can get further clarification because I've had conversations with some members about it. Um, can we Sorry, just clarify, Peter, in the SL1 that we got, it referred to it coming into operation on the 10th of March. Have we sought some clarification as to whether or not that's the case? Chair, that's, that's one of the key things we need to find out. Often in an SL1, it will give a date um, as a planned for date. What we need to find out is if the department is planning to put an SL1 to the business office late today. Um, obviously, we haven't approved an SL1. We certainly haven't seen an SR. So, yeah, I'll be I'll be clarifying that with the with the department um, immediately. Okay. Okay, members. So then we're going to move on to um, agenda item 14, which is date, time, and place. Oh, Peter would like us to look at the forward work program. It is at um, page 255 of your packs. Um, and members will have had a chance to, to see it in their pack before today. So, are members content with the, the forward work programme and that the committee staff um, go ahead and, and organise those briefings? Chair, in relation to the forward work programme, last week at our committee we, we indicated that we would take a briefing uh, in uh, regard to uh, insulating houses and retrofitting. Um, I think that this probably needs to be reflected in our forward work, work programme as well, because I don't see it there. Chair, um, I was going to say the forward work programme is a, is a, a super movable feast at the minute. Um, it's on our it's on our list of briefings to organise, Chair. Um, Sinead, other Sinead is, is, is gallantly working on that as we speak, but no, absolutely, it's, it's on our list of, of two to organise briefings, um, and we'll try and get that one up fairly quickly because I'm really conscious it also um, feeds into the energy strategy, which is, is very rapidly approaching, um, and we need to understand just exactly what the capabilities there are around retrofitting homes, public sector, estate, etc. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on then, item 14, the date, time and place of the next meeting. Um, members will be glad to hear that there is no meeting next Wednesday morning because of St. Patrick's Day. Um, so we have a, a bit of a break. And then our next meeting is on Wednesday the 24th of March. And it is our concurrent briefing with infrastructure and agriculture committees on TSS. So it will take place in the Senate that, that morning, and then we'll move back into room 30 after that briefing. So um, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you, members. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.